Good evening, everyone. I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday, November 16, 2021, at 6.30 p.m. We received an email from Commissioner Terrapani stating that he will not be able to attend the regular session this evening due to personal reasons. He's asking to be excused. We need a motion. So moved. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahuzas? Yes. Ms. Jacobs, we need a roll call for the meeting. Mayor Alahuzas? Here. Vice Mayor Carr? Here. Commissioner Tara Penny is absent and excused. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Here. Tonight's invocation will be given by Major Ted Morris from the Salvation Army, following by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you please stand. The invocation tonight includes a prayer given by William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, when he was asked to open the U.S. Senate in prayer in 1903. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we come to you knowing that your presence is among us. Thank you for those here upon whose shoulders the mantle of leadership has been placed. We pray that they will reason, that they will think, that they will plan, and that they will seek only compliance in those measures and opinions which are wisest and best. Oh, may they seek your wisdom, God, and may they rely on your great arm, and may the results of their deliberations end in the direction of your glory and the good of mankind. While they are considering matters that are for the welfare of this great community, may they not only consider those who are able to secure the conditions of life that are essential to health, morality, and religion, but may they remember those who have no representative to voice their sorrow, their concerns, and cares. Remember, in your infinite mercy, these poor lost members of our community, and may your blessings be upon us all. For it is in your holy and precious name we make this prayer this evening. Amen. flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to announce that uh, <coughs> the item number 10, the application 21-105, Northside Engineering, the uh, we have the first reading today, but I, uh, the 10B, the ordinance 2021-19, the future land use has been deferred. Also the uh, 10C, the ordinance 2021-20, rezoning has been deferred as well due to the advertising. Uh, we also have item number nine, A, B, and C, the ordinance 21-116-116, uh, and 21-117 is deferred to uh, December 7th. That was a request of the applicant. And also, I'd like to uh, advise everyone that at 7.30 p.m., the public hearing portion of the meeting must be start. Once the public hearing portion is completed, we will continue the meeting from where we left off. And also, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that based on the city rules and procedures, all public comments must be directed only to the chair of the meeting in a professional manner with respect without a personal attacks. Also cheering, clapping is not permitted during the uh, debate. Thank you. And now we're going to uh, public comments of the items that we're not going to be discussed this evening. If anyone has any comments, please come forward, state your name and your address for the record, and you begin with four minutes. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Anita Protos, 901 Bayshore Drive. I left the meeting last week uh, very uh, unhappy about what went on. Our employees of the city work hard for Tarpon Springs, and I heard the ugliness that was said about our planning director. She's been through hell in four meetings of attacks and ugliness. And this has to stop. Mayor, there has to be something we can do in the city that when this starts, you ask the, peop the person who's attacking someone to leave. We don't need this in Tarpon. And this has gone down county, and I found out today all the way through to Tallahassee, and it's embarrassing for our community. Uh, 
Mrs. Stinson is a highly regarded employee of this city. She does good work in the planning department and she should not have been attacked by people in the audience like she was attacked. It was wrong, it was ugly, and it was nasty. And that should not be here in the city. So we need to do something in our rules to say when they do that, you hit the gavel and ask them to leave. That's not right. And that's not freedom of speech. Freedom of speech doesn't do that to people in the public. And the young attorney that was representing the opposition here her attack on the other lady that was here giving testimony that happened years and years ago, I found very unhealthy and very defensive. So I took it upon myself to call the lawyer's board in Clearwater to file a complaint. It's ridiculous that we have to sit here and have people act that way when we're supposed to be a city of good heart, manners, and integrity. So whatever it takes, we need to stop this ugliness and I think an apology by the board should be given to Ms. Vincent. It was, I have no, I'm not, I don't run around with her. I don't have a friendship, uh, except a respectable re friendship with her for what she does for the city. And when one candidate came up here and said, all of y'all were wrong and y'all need to walk off the board and not be commissioners, no candidate should say that. So if someone says something like that, you know what I thought of? Hitler. That's bad. So read the book about America and Marxism, and you'll see some people here that were just like it, what you see in the book. It's scary. It's, it's not acceptable. And we need to learn to watch our words and be kind and considerate of others. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor and fellow commissioners, the city's senior city staff, Robert Rockline, 755 North Lake Boulevard here in Tarpon Springs. And uh, we can agree to disagree about opinions, uh, and I'll be happy to review any recording because I left after I spoke that evening when you took your break. Uh, but being in public service for 39 years and being a civil servant, sometimes you have to take the eggs, uh, even though you may have your best clothes on. Uh, I wanted to speak first uh, or as early as possible because I have another local HOA meeting to attend. Uh, let me start by wishing you and your families all, both the commission and the city, senior city staff, a very happy Thanksgiving, healthy one. We have a lot to be thankful here in Tarpon Springs, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, I was planning on speaking tonight and being very critical, very condescending and very costing, caustic, giving the board's vote last time regarding the Anna Claude Harbor Apartments. Uh, like many, I was extremely disappointed, and after being able to attend church twice this weekend, once on Saturday right from the airport because I had some plans on Sunday, but it was so good I went back Sunday morning again and uh, decided to change, change my tune, change my tone here uh, a little bit. So I'll revert back to my normal constructive and contributive nature, at least for tonight. Uh, my approach over the last 30 plus years in civic organizations has been consistent engagement with local governments and our elected officials to help you to help us solve our problems whenever possible and if needed to assist you in that help of us uh, in the process and it's worked out very well in the vast majority of cases and I'm talking about several major jurisdictions like cities of nine million towns of over a million, villages of, of hundreds of thousands. Uh, accordingly, we always encouraged our elected officials from telling us what they can't do and focus on what can be done, even if that was a shorter list. Uh, the, that effect of, of partnership between the public and the government by far is the best answer, even if it results in outcomes that neither party is too happy with or not favorable to either one or both sides. People like yourselves were elected to represent us and given a seat at the table for matters which are more often than not of importance to us. And that in itself is a great privilege, but with that privilege comes great responsibility, both to us, the citizens, to other taxpayers like business owners and such, and even to yourselves and your own families. I feel that in this case, the responsibility may have been taken too lightly. There's almost always time for continuing dialogue, constructive input that can result in some sort of compromise or concession with big projects like this, and result in some greater, maybe enduring benefits for the city and its citizens. So I think we were kind of shortchanged in this. 
this project needed a lot of zoning and planning variances. That's the time when, when they need stuff, that's the time to grab them and say, well, great, here's our list of what we need. So it, it may be more blessed to give than to receive, but that doesn't, I've never seen that applicable to large scale development. Uh, I've seen, as you said tonight, Mayor, the, the comments be directed to the chair at these meetings. But whenever a question is asked, either by myself or other people that I've known, uh, it doesn't seem to get answered or at least referred to somebody else on the city staff or something for a little sidebar out in the hallway or garnering contact information so somebody can get back to them in the following days. Uh, some commissioners themselves are even berated for outside contact with, with their constituents. That's what they're elected for. They're, they're representatives. They should be able to answer a question. And whether or not they give their opinion, that's part of freedom of speech too. So unless you have some law that entails that, uh, I don't see that as being. That's, I've never seen that in 39 years of public service. And that makes the law enforcement part of me antennas go up that either there's mere suspicion or reasonable suspicion that there's some disingenuous reason for that. It's very common every place else for this dialogue to be engaged. So I'm a little late to the party here. Thank but, you very much. Yeah, and I applaud your comprehensive plan coming up. That's what you need. Thanks for your opinion. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening, BJ Wolf, 412 Denise Street. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak last week. If this is already part of the, the process, uh, forgive me, but I would like to make a suggestion. Um, after we got done last week, you know, went on the hallway, I had a, a great conversation with several of the other uh, people with opposing positions. And at least in my line of work, uh, and, and if you get, and I'll, I'll stop talking if you guys tell me there's already a post mortem already in place. And what I mean by that, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, is we, if the, all the opposition, especially on a big project, whether it's this Anclo project or whether it's a whole nother project that gets the, the citizens very engaged like it was, I would suggest that we document what those uh, uh, thoughts and those, the, the, I don't want to say opinions, facts, different uh, positions that were expressed throughout the, the hearing. And after the project is done, the city actually does a post-mortem and they look at those, those positions and they actually document it so that when future projects come up, we have actual statistical data that, that reflects back on those, those insights that the, that the constituents had brought forward. I, I mean, I hope that makes sense. I'm not, if I'm explaining it well enough, but uh, I'd be willing to make myself available for anybody that wants to dig a little deeper into this, but I think that looking at whatever the project is that has that kind of influence in the, in the, in the uprise from the, the constituency, looking at it after the project is done, the votes are done, you all may be gone and maybe a whole nother staff that's up there, but it affords us a real look at, through a, 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 a looking back and being the Monday morning quarterback, were those types of objections or uh, did everything get addressed and it, you know we'll, we'll have real data to, to look forward to future uh, positions so I thank you very much thank you thank you next speaker please Good evening, everybody. Forte Coolianus, 1185 South Pinellas Avenue. Uh, first off, I would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for a wonderful uh, Veterans Day celebration we had. Everything you had to say there to honor our veterans was, was really a, a beautiful time. I think everybody that was a veteran that was present at both of the ceremonies the city held, as well as the private community, uh, I think all the veterans walked away from that uh, feeling very appreciated by our community. I think it was a very nice event. Um, I'd also like to thank the police chief. Uh, today we had a representative come out and assist with planning for the safety portion of Epiphany, uh, which I'm involved in, and I'm very excited as our city nears. Uh, we're less than two months away now from one of the best days I think we have in this city. I think it's, it's very important now that uh, we continue to move forward, that we, we look at the holidays. I saw on Facebook today a gentleman talking about moving away from the north, coming down to, to Florida. It's tough in the holidays, not feeling like it's uh, a very holiday spirit 
type event, but I think one thing here in the city is we do an amazing job of, of uh, presenting different events for the holidays, for children and everything. So I thank the city for everything they do with that. I know it's very special to me and my children. <laughs> Uh, to our first responders, I know as, as we approach the holidays, it's difficult to work during those times, so I thank all of them, but, but most importantly, thank you guys so much for, for assisting us at the church with, with what we have coming up with Epiphany. Uh, Tareen is, is a real gem to, to work with, so we appreciate that. Um, to speak on, on some of the points that were made earlier, I do believe the divisiveness it's sad to see. I think some of it is warranted. You know, I think it's important to be able to have a, a, a varying opinion. Um, but as the gentleman that just spoke before me said, you know, he went out into the hallway. He did have some spirited discussions with people. And at least from the interaction I had with him, even though him and I disagree with some things, I, I think it's nice to see two people be able to have a, a kind conversation. So I'm looking forward to moving past the ugliness. I think that, that there's a lot of opportunity for that. But I just, I, I wanted to get up and speak on some positivity, and I think we have a lot of that to look forward to the holidays. And I do wish all of you commissioners and, and staff here at the city a very happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have some time with your families to, uh, to relax and enjoy that and put all of this behind us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next person, please. Any other public comments? Here none. We now go on to the uh, consent agenda. Item number one is the attorney fees. A. Trash Diano, invoice November 5th, 2021. B. E. S. Johnson and Johnson, invoice 8596. The item number two is the award file, file 220080, uh, excuse me, 220051. N. A. S. Single source purchase of on-base maintenance and support. Number three is the award file. Number 220045 and AM, single source purchase of Pierce Fire Operators of Regional Equipment Manufacturer Parts and Services. And number four is the award file number 220046 and AM, single source purchase of uh, Booker Municipal of Regional Equipment Manufacturer Parts and Services. Are there any items that you'd like to pull? No. I hear none. <coughs> we go to public comments on the items one through four. Are there any public <coughs> comments on those items? I hear none. The chair will detain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Are there any commission comments, questions? I hear none. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzas? Yes. We're going to a uh, special consent agenda, which is the item number five, provide feedback, approve a uh, comprehensive plan, public engagement strategy, staff report. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Renee Vincent, Planning Director. Um, so as you recall, uh, we recently entered into uh, or awarded a request for proposals to Tyndall Oliver to conduct our update to the city's comprehensive plan. Um, we've been working with our lead consultant, um, who is Catherine Hartley, and she's here. Um, I wanted, just wanted to introduce her to the board. Um, and we've been working together on uh, the development of a community engage outreach and an engagement plan. And so I just I wanted to get that in front of the board um, for input, make sure that we are you know, not missing the mark. Um, the uh, we have a fairly extensive set of public engagement opportunities um, <clears throat> uh, you know, to take place. Um, one of the things that I would like some specific input from the board on, um, one of the things that was in the proposal was the, um, the idea of a, using a steering committee um, as part of the, part of the plan, planning process. Um, in order to kind of uh, keep the link with the strategic plan process, um, one, of the th one of the thought processes was to use, maybe reconvene that same stakeholder group that you appointed for the strategic plan and use them as um, in, in that uh, steering committee role for the comprehensive plan, or we can simply go about selecting another, another committee to form a, to sit in that, um, uh, in that, uh, in that process. So, Looking for some input on the board for that specifically, and then as well as the overall um, 
format of our of our engagement sessions we we do have engagement with all of our appointed boards um, as well as the general public um, you as the the board of commissioners the steering committees um, and then we, we you know, in terms of our general public outreach uh, we do plan to have um, like pre-recorded learning sessions and then survey and, and exercises that go along with that. So if you don't, if you can't get to a public workshop, you can do the same thing online. Um, so that's, that's the format that, some of the formats that uh, we're entertaining. So with that, and Catherine, do you want to add anything? Oh, get Catherine up here in front of you so you can meet her. Hi, good evening. I'm Catherine Hartley. I'm the community planning director for Tyndale Oliver. I'm the project manager for this project. Um, and like Renee said, we're just here tonight to uh, get your okay on our public engagement strategy. Um, we, when we presented to the selection committee, we said it's really important to um, be on step with your strategic planning process. Um, there are some comprehensive plan issues coming out of the public comment already, and we just wanted to make sure that there wasn't confusion with the public or to ask the same question twice. Um, and so again, we just wanted to make sure that this, that to figure out what your committee is going to be and if this is okay with you and we can make adjustments as needed if you wanna go a direction, so a different direction. Thank you. You finished? Yes. Okay, we're gonna to go to public comments now and come back to you, thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Hey, Bonnie Autiscuyas, 595 Peninsula Avenue. Uh, I just had a couple quick questions regarding, um, I know the deadline was November 14th or 15th for everybody to get their comments into the Connect website. Uh, can we get some numbers to see how many people participated and given their involvement in the comprehensive plan? And do we have any, is this platform that we're talking about, ma'am, is, um, is it another website that our people are gonna to have to go to to go be involved with it? Um, I think there, there is a recipe if maybe she's able to look into uh, our Facebook community pages. There's 10,000 people in one, there's five, 6,000 people in another. We've shown a, a simple recipe that everybody can use where you can send out certain topics and you'll get five, 600 comments at times. So the downfall to it is staff does have to manually go look at the comments and be able to sort them out, but you're really getting a good percentage of your population replying back. So I do, I would like to see the numbers up until November 15th, just to see how many people are starting to go to that Connect website. And if it is a lot of people, then maybe we keep pushing it. But like I said, we have to be able to reach out to the citizens, come to them where it's easy. They like to be on their phones, interact with stuff, and answer a couple city questions, and get back to making fun of themselves and posting some stuff on Facebook. So uh, it's a new day and age, and we got to be able to interact with the citizens a little bit better to do what they want us to do in town with this comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Here, yeah, none. Ms. Vincent, I have a couple of things I'd like to. Uh, discuss with you as you stated public involvement is very very important in this process can you explain the methods that you're using to notify and to engage the advisory board and the public uh, some of the so we do want to use the connect tarpon springs as as the platform for you know online surveying and things of that nature um, we do absolutely need to you know, take advantage of social media where we can. So the city's Facebook uh, presence. Um, we do want to use uh, the availability of sending out um, mailers through the utility bills, um, and then just our, our general you know email um, distribution groups that we have through all the various departments. So <clears throat> that's you know that's kind of a, a, a cross section of. I mean, they're all you know there will be required formal notices, obviously for you know for public meetings that will be taking place. Um, especially with when we're gathering the advisory boards, um, like planning and zoning board and board of adjustments and stuff. So you know, we'll have to do notices for those as public you know, public workshops. Um, so did, did that answer your question? Yes. Um, the advisory boards are that's going to be a public uh, public. I mean, public hearing, correct? 
they ha they'll be noticed as public workshops, um, you know, whether or not they're public hearings in the formal sense. Uh, we, we haven't really like nailed that Like a town hall meetings down. then? Excuse me? Just like a town hall meetings? Correct, okay. correct. That's good to get all the, inform you know, the information, the concerns that I have. Uh, in regards to the steering committee to act as a sounding board, uh, I would like to use the same stakeholders that we have for the stra uh, strategic plan. How does that work out with the strategic plan so far? Uh, the, the stakeholders, you know, I think the, the difference, and we probably, if that's the consensus of the board, if we want to use that same group, um, I think initially we probably want to reach out to them and see if they're willing to participate. Um, this, with, this, with the strategic plan, it was a one-time, you know, interview, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. and this is, a, so this is a little different um, role that we would be using them. It would be more working as a group. So that, that is a difference. So if, if, that, if we want to try to go that route, we can reach out to that committee, those members, and see if they're willing to sit in a, in a you know, as like a focus group. Um, otherwise, you know, we can, I think the other thought process I had was if we want to just try to solicit a new group, maybe we put something out to the public and try to get volunteers and then maybe pick from that, from that group. Um, I don't know, do you have a, like an ideal number that you're, for, for the focus groups? Or for the steering committee? Yeah. How many is on your current? About 25, committee? I think, is on yeah. the steering committee. When you start to get above 30 folks, it, it starts to become a little ineffective and you, you have to start breaking things up, which we can do. But um, sometimes when you get that many people, some folks won't feel like they have a voice and won't say anything, or someone <coughs> will control the conversation. So try to keep it less than 30 people, I think, would be ideal. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, well, since the uh, strategic plan is a continuation of the uh, comprehensive plan, uh, I would like to keep them the same people. Of course, I'd like to hear from my uh, fellow commissioners to see what they think, but uh, I would like to keep the same, uh, same group of people since we already went through the process. Mm -hmm. And they know uh, what we're looking for from the uh, strategic plan, which is some, you know, it's a continuation for the comprehensive plan. That's certainly efficient, so yeah, we appreciate thank you. that. Thank you. Vice Mayor Carr. Thank you. Uh, Renee, just a follow-up question. So is it like one meeting for a focus group or multiple meetings? Uh, what would, I think what we, we have two steering committee workshops scheduled. Okay. Two uh, workshops. Two workshops. Um, and how long are the workshops typically? Are they during this? Uh, <laughs> fix that. I'll fix it. Mark watching TV. Two three hours at the most. <laughs> no, I mean, two to three hours at the most. Two or three hours? Okay, are those at night or during the day, do you know? That's to be determined. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I think people I selected, I'm not sure if they would be, or the residents I selected, if they would be interested in doing that, mm -hmm. I would like to follow up. Uh, I, I mean, and then if we need to go like four instead of five each to have a little bit smaller of a group, that might be something we need to mm -hmm. look at as well. Uh, but I would like to at least make an effort to reach out to the individuals, but I, I'm indifferent about it. I mean, I, I do like the people, I, the residents I, I put forward on the strategic plan. Uh, I think they were, we had a diverse group uh, across the board, I think, uh, as the whole board. So um, I, I'm, I'll go either way. Um, I'm happy to pick, um, put new names out again, just cap it off at four or three, I don't, I don't know. And then um, I'm good using the same group too. But I just want the time, I, I want to at least give them a respect to reach out and see if they're interested right. um, with it. And we can, we can revisit this, you know, and, you know, when another, another meeting here, you know, coming up, just, but I wanted to get some initial feedback. Okay. I've got, yeah, I've got no further questions. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Dunham. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, Ms. Benson. So as far as the steering list goes, I'd be comfortable using the same list, but I think the biggest problem is going to be reaching out to them and confirming that they'd be willing to do it. Because I, I mean, I can't commit that, hey, everybody on my list is going to be available to be a part of the steering committee. It depends on the time. It depends on the year, you know, the time of the year. Um, so I think reaching out to them and then maybe following up with the alternates mm -hmm. at that point, because maybe somebody could do the one-off strategic plan interview, but they can't do the steering committee. So okay. at that point, it might be good to dip into the alternates. So if we can... If we can actually go person by person and confirm, then I'd be mm -hmm. comfortable with that. But I don't want to just blanket sit here tonight and say, hey, 
you know, go for it. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable doing it as long as we confirm and we can circle back if, you know, a certain amount of people can't do it or something like that. Um, I did just have a couple questions uh, as far as the actual schedule goes. Um, I, I noticed that there were some meetings scheduled for mid-June through August of 2022. And I just wanted, this is almost more of a note, I just wanted to make sure that wouldn't conflict with the budget meetings. I mean, typically the board will meet at least three times for budget workshops. Right. Then you have the actual, you know, budget adoption in, in September. So that's going to be a lot of meetings. I don't know how they can kind of make those fit, but that's just almost more of a heads up that sure that that's going to be a really jam-packed time. And this, you know, as, when we move forward with the strategic plan, the comprehensive plan, that's the kind of stuff that's going to inform those budget decisions. Absolutely. So it might be a little awkward, you know, if we have three budget work sessions and then a comprehensive plan meeting, that kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to ask, what what does the note, a note on the last page says, public notices shall read one or more elected and or appointed officials may attend any public meeting. Is that just addressing who's going to be showing up to these? Is that going to be the it's whole board? It's public or? notice required. So, you know, if you're going to have, you know, there, there are general meetings available to the public, but if three commissioners or two commissioners show up, we want the public to be aware. We want them to be noticed as potential public meetings. So it's just a kind of a catch-all for making sure that we're giving proper notice since boards, appointed boards, will be, you know, meeting in one room. Okay. So, it, yeah, it's just a public notice issue. Gotcha. Okay, I have, I have no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Ticotas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm fine with using the um, the same group. I, I suspect we'd have to go through the same thing anyway with anyone new um, to go and ask them whether they would be available as well. So I, I think that would be a good starting point with who we have right now. Um, does it look like the public schools element is going to be dropped? Or do you think that it'll continue? The, the reason why I'm asking is I we don't have anyone from the Education Committee, and I had asked okay. for some consideration from Ms. Um, Lisa Fatalitas to be mm -hmm. part of that stakeholder group, and I still think that's a void. Maybe that would be something that the Commission would consider to add her as a stakeholder since we don't have anybody on the group to sure. cover uh, public schools. That's given, and we do have a public schools element. We, we do, and we haven't really discussed dropping it. I mean, I think there's benefit to having it, you know, to continue that coordination from an <coughs> intergovernmental standpoint, so. Okay, that's the one thing I'd, I'd like okay. to ask the Commission this evening for that consideration to add Ms. Fadalius, if she's willing to do that, of course. Um, the, um, I, I know that we had a general kind of discussion of the methodology and the approach, I think, if I remember right, I may not even, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't recall the detail, but I do know there's gonna be a status report at some point uh, describing how things are progressing in terms of the comprehensive plan. You mean the strategic uh, plan? No, I'm, no, the comprehensive plan. Okay. Or has that not been done yet? Have we been given a formal uh, presentation on how the review, for example, the um, I was interested in whether we're going to take the same approach as we did with the uh, evaluation and appraisal um, uh, report process that was back in 2006, 2007, which was somewhat of a formal thing. Mm -hmm. From what I've read in the backup tonight, it, it, that I don't see that in there, and I don't know whether that's going to be the case or not. We're 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 in we're ahead of the evaluation and appraisal formal. Requirement. We're kind of, you know, we're several years ahead. Um, so, you know, whether or not we would, I mean, and they've really, DEO kind of did away with the formal evaluation and appraisal process. Right. Yeah. So it's up to the board as to whether or not you want to do a full evaluation and appraisal. Um, you know, I think we're doing it anyway as we go through this whole update process. You know, we're looking at a pretty broad overall update of the plan. So, um, by the time we get to our to the EAR requirement, we're going to be done. And so at that point, I think we would just tell DEO, we're not doing a formal evaluation and appraisal report. Here's our new plan. We've already done this. So, well, um, and that's fine. I was just using that in the context of some process that we're going to be following. Whether we follow the year process or not is is not really right. important. Um, as long as what the results are, that outcome. And I, I do know the uh, last time it took a couple of years to start implementing changes. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you have to pass them through DCA and everything uh, for that to happen. Right. Um, 
so at some point I would like to get an update Absolutely. on how we're going to approach this um, and, and the methodology I know mm -hmm. this is just part of it right and the, it, concerning this aspect of it uh, for example there was some discussion that we do have the 11 elements of the comp plan as they exist I know I have brought up the possibility of adding deleting uh, changing uh, sustainability whether that was going to be a separate element or whether that was going to be integrated with the other elements across the board um, and and then also for example I, I feel strongly we need an economic development element that has been adopted by several cities we don't have that either so I guess my question is when we um, expose our residents the stakeholders group for example and even people that are coming into connect tarp and springs are we suggesting or telling them think out of the box on this thing there may be some areas that are not part of these 11 elements that are important to the city's future in terms of needs and, and um, deficiencies that we need, we should address and especially from a policy perspective mm. or, or is there some communication on our part that we're doing to make sure they they, they have that information that that ability to communicate that are we st staying strictly with just going through element one through 11 no I don't think that we're st in fact you know, my goal and I think we've communicated that with our with a consultant is we really want to just like we you know, the strategic <coughs> plan is going to be kind of focused around some broad key areas you know I would love to be able to reorganize those elements under very similar broad key areas and focus areas so to that end yes I mean we need to know what those interests are we, we you know we're getting a bit of a jump on that just because of the strategic planning effort and where it is we're going to be getting results back from the citizen survey um, and every, we should be getting a good you know we've been a good point to be able to use that information and parlay that over to okay now how does how can this also apply to the comprehensive plan so i think i'm fully on board with where you are um, I don't know that we've fleshed out the, the minute details of how we're going to get those inputs. I don't, Catherine, do you have anything you want to add to that? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to address several things that I've heard so far, if that's okay. Um, on our staff, we do have a person who is um, special, basically 85% of her job is social media and doing that kind of communication for us, so we're prepared to do that. Um, also, we have already been plugged into your Connect site, so there's not going to be a separate project website. We're going to work through your existing platform so that everybody knows what's going on. Um, when I presented to your selection committee, I basically said, you know, here's our approach to the project. There are the things that you have to do under Florida statute, and then there's the cool stuff that you want to do, like an economic development mm -hmm. element, this, you know, incorporating sustainability, all those things that the public are going to tell us that they want to commit to, and that's great. What we want to do at first is go through your plan, find internal inconsistencies, places where stuff may not necessarily be in plain English. It's really important for your community to be able to say, I know what this means, because if there's conflict, you'll get crazy public hearings that go really, really late and people getting upset and fighting, right? Um, so that's our basic approach is to to come to you and show you the things, here are the things that we have to do and cover, cover that based on the statute. Uh, the question about the evaluation and appraisal report, that landscape has changed so much since 2006. Um, you no longer have to do that very broad-based, issue-based, giant report that costs thousands and thousands of dollars, right? Basically, you just go through the changes in Florida statute and say, okay, here's the stuff that we have to address, and yes, we're gonna be doing that as part of this project. Um, you are ahead, of, you're like your next official year is in 2023, so you're ahead of the game here, but again, we're gonna address any statutory changes since the last time you updated your plan. Hopefully that answers all the questions you all had. It, it does to, to some extent, um, and, and I guess the best way to address is I'm gonna have to have my antenna up because the public talks in very general plain English terms mm -hmm. and somehow and uh, much of our comprehensive plan is highly technical especially in the transportation multimodal you hear things like that that people on the street are not going to be talking about so somewhere along the line their comments are going to have to be uh, translated into something that fits <coughs> the format of a comprehensive plan and also for example economic development 
Um, I really see that as a huge debate. We're all over the place when it comes to discussions up here. You know, some of the commission talks about um, needs-based economic development, which is good for a community that's got a lot of room to expand and things. Others talk about place-based or asset-based economic development, <coughs> which is a community that's nearly built out and you need to transition. So those things haven't even been touched, but they're extremely important to the city's future. And I just wanna make sure whatever process we expose the public to, they understand that that's all part of the discussion and that they need to understand because eventually that's gonna be their plan. It's gonna be our plan to work from, but it's gonna be their plan that, that um, that they're gonna have, a, a, I would hope, a very uh, significant hand in, in, in creating, and that when we're discussing it in f some final format, they're out there and they're understanding what we're talking about and that that's their product, and somehow there's gonna have to be some, again, translation of what we're doing uh, up here is really what they've been talking about, even though they, it may not be in their terms, but, it, but their thoughts, their opinions, their wishes have been incorporated into that plan. That's my concern. And I, I guess the best thing is at this point is just to kind of keep track of this process. And that's why I was asking for an update to see how things are going and, and um, um, in that regard. We um, um, will submit a progress report to you every month when we submit an invoice. And so yeah. Ms. Vincent has already received a first progress report from us when we submitted our invoice for September and October. Um, basically, we've already done your required mapping updates, and we're going to meet with staff and show them what we've done so far here in a couple of weeks, before, hopefully before Thanksgiving. Um, and so, yes, you will get you publicly accessible monthly status reports of where we are. And, and the public information that you're going to gather, how, how is that going to be actually uh, taken into account? You're just going to be looking for those things that are important that is kind of a recurring theme from the public and you're gonna say, well, we really need to focus on this and this is the way the public is wanting to go and this is maybe the way we should suggest the commission should understand that this is a, a majority view of the public that we've talked to. Is that the idea or is this um, it just to help you from a, uh, to make sure that you've got all aspects of the comp plan, at least the way we have it right now with the 11 elements covered. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd oh like yeah, to I, I know that. exactly yeah. what you're saying. Uh, both of those things are very important. Um, sometimes uh, just being able to guide the conversation a little bit um, will be part of that public involvement, um, meaning some things are more appropriate for your zoning code than your comp plan, especially if you need a little flexibility in there. Um, and so those are things that we'll, if we need to educate folks on, that's what we'll do. But this is a big listening session, and we've got a huge chunk of budget dedicated to listening and responding and taking that input and it's not going to be ignored i assure you but again we are going to emphasize here's the stuff you have to do under the statute and do, does that make okay. sense yeah no that's fine okay. and the last comment uh, actually a question do you see anything that you may need from us to to proceed or just do you your see guidance it? okay and where you want to go all right so basically tonight you're looking for affirmation of what you've presented in the in the report the letter letter report and memorandum and also as far as a stakeholder group so you can get started on that is that right um, so on the stakeholder group um, we had the the group and then we had those identified alternates um, if you're okay with it I would prefer to just go ahead and reach <coughs> out to the group and the alternates and see who's interested in who can participate or is willing to participate and then we'll come back to the board with um, uh, you know, with that with that group and let kind of let you know where we are and if we think we need to find some additional people um, but I think going ahead and including the alternates is probably a good thing at this point um, to uh, make sure we get you know as, as large a group as we can yeah. committed out of that group if, if the commission takes that route, that'll solve my question concerning Ms. Fowley, mm -hmm. that she is a, an alternate. Mm -hmm. So, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. We uh, need to have a motion, since we don't do a consensus anymore, to give a direction to the staff and also to include about the uh, steering committee. Um, motion. I, I move to um, approve the approach that has been presented to us with proceeding with the comprehensive plan and the uh, citizen engagement and outreach and also to um, uh, utilize the, strate the strategic planning stakeholders 
and as well as the alternates of that group for Ms. Vincent to survey them to see who's available. And then you'll be providing a list back to us concerning that, I'll right? I'll bring that okay. back, yes. Thank you. Ms. Vincent, anything else that you want to include? Are you okay with it? No, I think I'm good with that. That's good. what we needed. I just wanted to make Second. sure that. Second. Any other comments, questions? Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahuzis? Yes. We have 15 minutes left to get to the uh, public hearing. I don't know if we have enough time to do the next one. I don't think so, Mayor. So uh, we're going to take a break. We'll come back at 7.30 with the uh, public hearing. It, you, we don't have to stop at 7.30 when, you're, when we're on the agenda item, so we could finish it. Yeah. Let's take a little break and come back. Okay.
We are now reconvening the BOC meeting at 7.30 p.m. and we started with the uh, ordinance of resolutions. The item number eight is the ordinance 2021-25, the application 21-39 vacation of right away at Haight Avenue, north of Live Oak Street and this is the second reading. City Attorney, if you please read the ordinance. Ordinance number 2021-25, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, vacating and abandoning the right-of-way, ROW, of Huey Avenue lying between the Pinellas Trail and East Live Oak Street, providing for conditions, providing for findings, providing for a reservation of easement, providing for recordation in the public records of Pinellas County, and providing for an effective date. Ms. Vincent, you have a staff report? Uh, good evening, Mayor Commissioners. Again, this is application 21-39, ordinance 2021-25, uh, to vacate a portion of, it's a dead-end portion of Huey Avenue between the Pinellas Trail and Live Oak Street. Uh, this is second reading. There's been no new information to be pre presented into the record, so I would enter all the previous staffing um, and reports uh, into the record, and staff recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Any public comments on this item? Hear none. The chair will retain a motion. Motion to approve. Are there any uh, commission comments on this item? I'll second it, I'm sorry. Uh, I just got a quick comment from Renee. Okay. Our question. Uh, Renee, this is, was this like city, uh, did the, I'm sorry, did the property owner come to the city and say, hey, do you want to vacate yes. this? Okay, I just want to make yes. sure this is, all right, yes. thank you. Okay, any other comments? Roll call, please. Just for the record, this uh, ordinance was advertised by title only in the Tampa Bay Times on October 13th and on November 3rd. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Yes. As uh, announced earlier, the uh, item number <coughs> nine has been deferred to uh, December 7, request of the applicant. So we're gonna go to uh, Item number 10, uh, item number 10 is a quasi-judicial. Item number 10, B and C have been deferred. So we're only doing the A portion, which is the, uh, um, which is the annexation part. See the attorney, if you please read the uh, resolution and explain the uh, quasi-process, please. Uh, yes, Ordinance 2021-18, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing 0.38 acres, more <coughs> or less, of real property, located at 1954 South Pinellas Avenue on the west side of South Pinellas Avenue, approximately 280 feet north of Klosterman Road, application 21-105, providing for findings and providing for an effective date. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. Are there any members of the board wishing to disclose any ex parte communications or conflicts of interest this evening with regard to this specific application? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak on this application, if you could please stand and raise your right hand to be sworn. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So sworn. If we could have the staff presentation, please. Thank you again. This is application 21-105 uh, from Northside Engineering <coughs> for property at 1954 South Pinellas Avenue. Uh, this is um, a hearing for the uh, second reading of the annexation ordinance only. That's ordinance 2021-18. 
Uh, the property consists of 0.38 acres um, on South Pinellas Avenue, and we will be hearing the actual land use, uh, land use and zoning uh, applications at a later date. Uh, there's no new information in, in, enter into the record, um, and staff recommendation is to approve um, as previously presented, and I would enter the previous uh, testimony and uh, evidence uh, into the record for tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Seth, quick question. Uh, uh, Renee, so just for, I guess, my application here, if one of the neighboring pieces of property wanted to annex into the, into the city for sewer, like th four doors down, and they're not touching a annex piece of property, is that something they could do, or is, it, is that an issue? Generally, um, no. So there's there's two ways you can annex into the city. One, you can be contiguous to the city boundary. Right. Um, the other is we do have areas that are identified as Type A enclaves. So if you have a um, an area of the city and it's complete or an unincorporated county, and it's completely surrounded by the municipal boundary. So it's like a it's literally an enclave in the middle of the city. Then through our interlocal agreement with Pinellas County, we can actually annex. Uh, parcels that don't necessarily touch the city boundary so if they're in the center of the enclave so I would have to look at this more closely I don't think this area would be considered a type A enclave so that was probably more than you wanted as an answer okay no, <laughs> I was just thinking uh, should we expect to see more of this along this corridor to be annexed into the city later on you think I mean I think certainly as you know especially <clears throat> as you know people want to come off of septic and sewer you know we you know, if we can't annex them because they're not contiguous, we get annexation covenants before we allow them to go ahead and hook up. So, um, I mean, yeah, I think you will see it, you know, get picked away at you know, over time. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff? Would the applicant like to question staff or make a presentation? Is the applicant in the audience this evening? Uh, no. Okay, no, he's not here. See him. He's not here. Okay. The applicant, just for the record, the applicant is not in the audience today. Are there any members of the public wishing to make any comments on this application this evening? Bonnie Kuyas, 595 Peninsula Avenue. <clears throat> uh, I'm happy we're annexing properties that are nearby on our borderline. Uh, there are plenty of neighborhoods in Tarpon Springs that we need to think about as long range planning to annex them and make them so they can vote in town and have sewer and all the amenities that our, our city has to offer. So it's a good way to increase our tax base with minimal impact. It's already been developed and it's something for the board to consider in the future, annexing <coughs> properties inside town. There's plenty of little pockets in that whole area over there um, that are considered unincorporated and they don't have voting rights in Tarpon Springs and we can unite tarpon strings and uh, by simply doing that thank you any other public comment on this item seeing none would staff like to make a final presentation no no with that um i will close the public hearing i did also want to mention that the ordinance was read by title only and legal advertising was published in the tampa times by title with a map on september 29th and october 6th 2021 Back to me. The chair will retain a motion on this item. So motion moved. to approve ordinance 2021-21 annexation. That's it. Do I have a second? Second. Are there any commission comments? No. Here none, roll call. Commissioner Fatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahusas? Yes. Next is item number 11. The ordinance 2021-14, this is the application 21-114, Land Development Code Amendment, A-frame signs is a second reading. City Attorney, would you please read the ordinance? Ordinance number 2021-14, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances, Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 11, Section 191.09, A-frame slash sandwich board signs, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, and providing for the effective date of this ordinance. This uh, was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on September 1st and November 3rd, 2021. Thank you. Ms. Vincent, your report, please. Uh, again, this is a second reading, and there's no proposed changes since first reading, and so staff recommendation is to approve as presented. 
Thank you. We'll go to public comments. Are there any comments on this item? Hearing none, the chair will obtain the motion on item number 11. Second? I'll make a motion to approve. You, you did? I just did. Just did. We need so you need a second to that? Mm hmm. Second. Okay. Are there any commission comments? Yeah, just to know, I voted no on the original ordinance. I just don't think we should have an ordinance that addresses A-frame signs. So for consistency's sake, I'm going to vote no on this one, too. Well, i also like to say that uh, now the business will be able to use the A-frame signs manufactured by wood, metal, or plastic frame material as they've requested to make it easier for them. And we're still going to have presentable and uniform and good-looking signs out there. So any other comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Vaticiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? No. Vice Mayor Carr? No. Mayor Alahuzis? Yes. Let's fail. It fails. Did you say yes? I said no. You said no? I said no. no. It, Mayor, it was 3 2 last time, and Commissioner Terrapani was the third vote. Okay. So that fails then, right? Yes. It fails. Can I get some direction? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, I guess we'll revisit this. That's all we can do. All right. Now we go to uh, item number 12, which is the uh, resolution 2021-57, the application 2021-130, <coughs> condition use Stumby, Stumby's Hatcher House at 201 East Center Street. This is a quasi-judicial, so uh, City Attorney, if you please read the tower. You already explained the quasi-judicial process. Uh, yes, this is for resolution 2021-57, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application 21-130, requesting conditional use approval to allow for an entertainment establishment with food slash drink service at 201 East Center Street in the T4C transect zone of the special area plan, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. This is also quasi-judicial proceeding. Um, the same procedures apply as before, that the uh, decision needs to be based on competent, substantial evidence. Are there any members of the board wishing to disclose any ex parte uh, communications or conflicts of interest with regard to this application? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak on this application, if you could please stand to be sworn if you've not already done so. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? says one first uh, staff presentation thank you again this is uh, application 21-130 uh, this is a conditional use application uh, the property is located um, at the northeast corner of Sa North Safford and East Center Street uh, this is an adaptive reuse of um, an existing uh, warehouse structure that's been renovated into more of a commercial structure um, So this, there, this is in the transit code, um, and it's in the T4C district. It's so it, it, it's a, from a code perspective, it's a little bit of a square peg, round hole situation. So that's why we did choose to go ahead and do the conditional use route. Um, the proposed use is for Stumpy's Hatchet House. So essentially, um, it's a facility that has, you know, lane throwing pits for where you can throw axes at a stationary wood target. Um, there will be some bar service available. Uh, at this point, they do not prefer, uh, not preparing any food on site. Um, and then they will have, um, and then a portion of the outdoor area, that, you know, they want a portion of the outside area they want to use for some, some outdoor activities. We can talk a little more about that. Um, but because um, this doesn't really fit cleanly into that T4C or really any district, these kind of entertainment type uses aren't really called out in the smart code. So it is commercial. So we're, we're putting it in that venue uh, along with what would we, how we would look at, you know, perhaps a restaurant, which would require conditional use review. So these are just some inter interior renderings of what the, you know, what the inside of the facility looks like. So you see the, these are your, your lanes for throwing. Um, so it's it's kind of a you know interesting adaptive reuse of a of a big open structure. Um, they do propose to have like a mezzanine area where you can go up top, you know, have a beverage, watch what's going on below. Um, this is the entire 
site, um, they are only using um, about half of the, st of the structure. Um, this outdoor, so this is Safford, this is Center. This area here, they want to convert into kind of an outdoor area between the trail um, and, the, and the building, you know, cornhole, things like that. So I'm sure they'll, they'll talk a little more about what, what the use is there, but really making a, a connection with the trail. Um, as an adaptive reuse, they're not required to provide any additional parking, um, but we, from a realistic perspective, we did ask them to do a parking study. Uh, they have a similar location in Tampa, so we asked them to look at what their parking needs actually are, and they did provide that information. So, um, you know, their peak hours, you know, around 27 spaces is what they need to accommodate, um, this, you know, their, their operations. Um, they do have 17 on 17 spaces on site, and then they actually have a parking lease um, with the property directly to the south. It's under the same ownership um, with uh, 32 spaces there. So during your off hour, your peak evening hours and stuff, there'll be ample parking. And there's also, there's available, you know, the public parking and you're within a very short walking distance. Um, the other things that are um, really need, uh, oops, excuse me, that need what we call adjustments by warrant. Um, the district does only allow for, you know, a seating of 20 seats, and, and what that really is based on is, you know, in a, in a much more, you know, residential area, you really want to limit the impact on a neighborhood. At this particular location, you're directly, and I'll show you in the maps in a second, you're directly adjacent to the downtown district. You have good parking, so we, we, we don't feel that there's a problem with increasing that seating allowance up to what they're proposing of just 75 seats in a mix of, you know, couches, bar stools, you know, picnic tables outside, things of that nature. The other limitation in the code is a, is a maximum 2,000 square foot net retail space, and they're proposing 2,165. So again, we're not concerned with that, that adjustment given the location of this um, and the available parking. Um, this is the downtown district, which is the most you know, intense district that we have um, in our smart code area. This, so this is literally across the street from it. So this whole site is a little bit um, out of step with the, with the district that it's in. So we're very comfortable with um, the recommendations that we've made. Uh, since it is a conditional use, we do have to review it for conformance with the land development code. Um, is the property uh, appropriate, is the use appropriate to the property in question and compatible with the area? Again, we think it is a mixed use area directly adjacent to the downtown um, so we do th you know we do th they're taking advantage of the trail so we th do think it is compatible with the area and consistent with the comprehensive plan in this instance consistent with the special area plan um, specific to that area um, it's not in the it is um, it's in the historic district but it's a non-contributing non-historic structure um, it's not an environmentally sensitive site we don't affect think that this will adversely affect adjoining property values um, uh, it's an infill, you know, adaptive reuse, so it does promote efficient orderly development and it should not affect the ability of the city to provide public facilities. Staff recommendation is approval of resolution 2021-57, granting the conditional use approval. Um, and we do recommend approval of the um, increased number of seats in the net retail space for the proposed use uh, to be allowed uh, by a warrant. Um, we did do our public notice. We've received no uh, correspondence. This did go to the Planning and Zoning Board last night, and it was very enthusiastically received with a unanimous recommendation of approval. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions that you might have. Any questions for staff? Uh, is there a time restriction at all, like uh, hours operation? Uh, not, not that's in our... Uh, as a restriction in the in the resolution, no, um, they may speak to their hours. Um, if that's something you want to consider. Okay, and currently there's not residential across the trail. It's like an open lot, and I think a business, right? Does that ring a bell? I believe so. Let me I believe that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any issues with like the the drive-through, um, Renee? So if they want to vacate the parking area to use as like outdoor space, is there any issues with having that driveway being there? No, no, I think okay. we're fine. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff? I, as far as that outdoor area, mm -hmm. um, you, you're not going to get into it. It's the applicant that's going to describe what he's doing as far as any uh, 
improvements of fencing or anything like that? Yeah, I'll let them describe it. I mean, if you, you know, on the on the diagram behind you, you know, I know their intent is to kind of put down a like a false grass surface here, soften it up, um, have some outdoor seating, cornhole, things like that. So it's it's just a kind of an, an outdoor play area, if you want to call it that. So I'll let them tell, talk a little more about it. And um, any discussion with the staff concerning music or outside noise or anything like that? Uh, we had no, there was no like outdoor entertainment being discussed, so we didn't really have any issues with that. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Does the applicant have any questions for staff? No. Nope. Would the applicant like to make a presentation? Brennan Wayman, 201 East Center Street. Good evening, Jason Kromalicki, 201 East Center Street. Steve D'Amato's, 201 East Center. Will Kokenauer, 201 East Center Street. Uh, I'll just uh, do a little introduction for us. Um, uh, thank you guys for considering this project. Um, uh, the presentation from the staff has been excellent. Uh, last night, the same with, um, uh, with Renee for the presentation for zoning. Uh, everything went great. Um, it has been a pleasure working with Tarpon um, in this process. Uh, everybody from building, uh, planning, zoning, everybody has been extremely helpful with this. Um, like Renee said uh, earlier, it was it was reassuring to see the enthusiasm from the zoning committee yesterday. Um, just reassured that we made the right decision to uh, bring this business to Tarpon Springs. Um, there's. This is a franchise uh, Stumpy's currently has, I think about 38 locations throughout the country. Uh, there's two in Florida right now. This would uh, potentially be the third one. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, it's just um, really reassuring that we've received such uh, positive um, uh, recommendations and, and uh, enthusiasm from Tarpon. So I'll turn it over to Steve. He can go over a little bit more about the uh, outdoor location and, the, and, and what we're gonna do inside. So on the proposed uh, outdoor use area, we will be move, pretty much uh, those parking spaces in the front are gonna go, we'll lay some turf down. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll have uh, outdoor patio loungers, we'll have picnic tables, we'll have cornhole, we'll have Jenga, you know, the life-size big Jenga, uh, Connect Four, uh, we're gonna have string lights out there. So we're gonna turn it into a very appealing beautiful spot coming from the trail as well as all your businesses up and down will be able to see it and provide just a, a sort of a, a nice tenure when you leave your restaurant or somewhere you'll see that as well as when you're uh, walking the trail riding the trail we'll have access uh, to our bars from the outside as well and we'll provide waters gator racings of that nature so folks can use our <coughs> establishment for trail riding and things of that nature um, we plan to incorporate a lot of the local businesses down uh, in the sponge docks in downtown uh, using uh, their restaurants to hopefully create a few small menus that we can have at our establishment and we'll go ahead and travel outside to get those items and bring them back to our patrons. So mm -hmm. uh, we again, we just in, encourage a lot of these local uh, restaurants and breweries that we're gonna carry their, brewer, their beers <laughs> and just participate and, and be a part of this. Uh, we do anticipate to be rather busy. That said, do you guys uh, have any questions or is there anything else? Are there any questions for the applicant? Yes, I do. Yes, go ahead, Mayor. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you to Tarver Springs and uh, we welcome new business, especially in that section on the North Safer Avenue. We're trying to develop that area for a long time to extend our uh, downtown business community. So finally it's happening. Um, this is really, uh, an entertainment that is different, I've never heard of it before. You say this is going to be the third in Florida. Did you have any uh, any safety concerns with the others, throwing the, the hatcher and all that? No, uh, so actually uh, we so also own uh, the one in Tampa. Uh, Brennan's the uh, majority <coughs> owner of the Tampa franchise. Uh, he can elaborate more on the safety that we go through. Okay. That. So as far as safety goes, uh, the moment somebody walks in the door, uh, we make sure they have closed-toed shoes on. Uh, no outside beverages, and then um, they have to complete a waiver. 
So once they complete the waiver, just like you go anywhere like that, um, we com uh, all that's completed. And then from there, we take them into a safety training room. And uh, safety is uh, uh, priority one, it's paramount for us. So we, uh, we, go, uh, we have a throwing coach who goes over the whole safety procedure, all of our rules and rec uh, uh, recommendations. From there, the, the throwing coach will take them back to their pit area, and then they give a good three to five minute um, synopsis on how to throw the ax. Um, and then from there, uh, once we let them loose, uh, we basically follow up on them every 10 to 15 minutes, making sure everything's going fine, nobody's getting out of control, throwing the ax too hard, or, or you know, going crazy with it. And uh, it usually goes for an hour timeline or a two hour timeline. So we're constantly on top of the um, individuals that come in uh, to make sure that safety is uh, priority yeah. one the whole time in there. So, so if so. I understand this correctly, the player's going to be in, in a cage type thing, or? Yes, so, so what do you do is you bring them to a pit and the way it is, if, if you look right there, uh, you can have two people um, throwing at once, but it's all, uh, the cage is to the side and where you're, it's 12 feet away. So basically at that point, they're going to, um, they throw together, retrieve together. So that's what we're making sure they're doing. And there's only one, uh, one ax on each side. So they're going up, retrieving it, bringing it back, <coughs> and then um, put, using the hatchet holder, swapping off, the next people come in if there's a group of four or something like that. That's how, how we're doing it. If it misses the target, it's not an issue to hit somebody, right? No, it, um, it will bounce off the, the target and it lands on, we got horse matting, um, where the horse matting ex absorbs uh, the hatchet and whatnot. So we've had, uh, the Tampa location's been open for over two, uh, two years and we've had no, no incidents to record. Oh good, that would've been my next question. Yes, 100%, we're, we're on it. And that's uh, one thing I do is I train the throwing coaches um, constantly. And then plus we have camera systems and we're constantly watching the cameras the whole time up front. We're making sure people aren't going crazy and out of control. So we're on top of it the whole time. And you have people supervised in the area, right? 100%. Okay. And there's special wood too that's used to absorb a lot of impact to where it doesn't provide that uh, bounce back as well. So we actually have to order special wood from uh, up north and we have it shipped. So there's a lot of things that go into it, into that to adhere to that safety for us. Because again, you know, we are concerned of safety as well. And it's a franchise. Okay. So they're very, very big on that. They'll inspect us. They, there's a lot of things that they're going to do and require us to, to do that you guys will probably fall, fall suit with. Yeah, thank you. In regards to outdoor seating, I think it's going to be nice. People can enjoy that. Uh, and in regards to parking spaces, looks like you're, you're going to have 17 and 32 is 49 spaces altogether, so that should be plenty. Yes, sir. Thank you, and welcome to Turpin. Thank you. Thank you. Any, questions? Any other questions? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, Go ahead. Just uh, how how'd you guys end up picking Tarpon, out of curiosity? Uh, I'm, I'm born, <laughs> born and raised here, um, and just seeing the trends come and go and, and to me it's, it's just something that we did uh, i own a few businesses we did it at his location that I actually didn't know he owned uh and we had such a good time and it was such a great place that there's a defining line in my opinion mcmullen booth folks from this side we aren't crossing mcmullen to go over to there <laughs> and folks from there aren't crossing to come over to here so if we can pull more people from clearwater dunedin down to our side and I think it's an easy drive down Ultra 19. We'll get more of that tourist attraction, more of the walk-ins, and more of really just more entertainment to, for folks to walk. Just a nice circle to go through downtown, down to the sponge docks, and I think uh, we'll just play into what you guys have <coughs> already. Great, yeah. Um, so just to touch a little bit more, you talked about using some of the local businesses, like the breweries. We have a ton of breweries right in the area, so you have taps from the local guys to help support them too. Yep, yep, exactly. We've already visited, uh, actually Brennan's visited quite a few. Um, we're well on our way to getting everything <laughs> together and, and we're, we're, that's our first, that's our priority is to get everyone on board. Uh, we do have booklets made to show what the renderings are. Uh, that way we're not going in blind and everyone does have an idea of what it's gonna look like. Uh, and it helps make that decision whether they're willing to partner with us, whether food, beverage, or so on. Yeah, the renderings look incredible, uh, I think, overall. and I. I love the idea that you have along the trail. Uh, typically, you see these in warehouse spaces kind of tucked away in the middle of nowhere. Um, <clears throat> I think that's kind of the one that's in Oldsmar, Tampa, right? That's like kind of in the back where you've kind of got to meander back there to find it. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> uh, so this is like right on the trail. And it's, I mean, it's a dream, I think, for the city to have something like this because it's you, along the trail corridor. Um, have you, when Stumpies, when they have their franchisee, like, um, 
I guess, target? Do they target areas like this, or do they want to target areas more like industrial areas because it's cheaper, or how does that really work? They're, they're, this is perfect. This is right up their alley. So they came down. Uh, once we find a space, the way it works is to get into the franchise. So the, the franchisors, they come down and they look at the venue, the space, mm -hmm. and uh, their eyes got this big, uh, yeah. huge. They just <laughs> couldn't believe it. They're all on board with it. They think this is, this is going to be the, the, the hit. You know, that's what they're feeling right now. So um, cause there's one in Brooklyn that's like kicking butt, but they're like, this one's going to be the next one up. Yeah. So they're very uh, excited for this to show up. I'm telling you the truth right there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a beautiful building already. The, <laughs> yeah, it's, it it's a beautiful yeah. building as it stands. And I think that you're going to compliment it pretty well um, overall. And what you talked about the outdoors. So you're talking about um, it's going to be permanent, like, it's not gonna be parking at all. So yes. um, if you're if you want to be outside with sandals on, you could be outside and have a beer out there and kind of enjoy the area off the trail, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent. And we'll have a, a, an outdoor bar that mm -hmm. you can walk up to. So really, you don't even have to come in to throw axes. If you're on the trail riding, you can stop, relax, come up, get waters, Gatorades, munch on something, uh, play a game, and then get back on your on your way. We tend to be, there's a lot of groups out there that bike ride up the trail right. and stop it. We tend to get heavily involved with a lot of these groups and just try and really start the ride here and let people experience Tarpon Springs as they leave and then as well as folks coming from Clearwater down to see what we have. And I think we'll be able to pull some people down. No, you're, I think you're 100% right. So thank you for bringing that up. It's going to be a it's going to be an attraction bringer to Tarpon Springs. We're going to bring a lot of people in Tarpon Springs with this project. So I uh, appreciate the, your presentation, answering the questions. Uh, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I'm super excited to, to vote on this tonight. And um, I'll stop there. Thank Thanks, you. Brother. Appreciate you. Coach Dunn. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, this is one of those ones that I saw, and I was kind of kicking myself for not going to the other location because it looks like a fun time. Um, is, there, is there an age limit? Is it like strictly a bar or could like I take a group of kids to go throw hatchets? So, uh, yes, um, originally uh, the way it worked out, um, the franchise started out with Stumpies. It was 21 and over. Uh, but from there, the pandemic happened. Um, and then we had to like get with the times as far as that goes. So we basically we have a waiver system where we go 18 and up normally. But we can we have family days uh, where we on Sundays, uh, it's 10, 10 and up. So as long as a parent uh, feels that their child is, is strong enough to, to you know, throw one um, and they're there to supervise them, there's a waiver signed. The parents sign the waiver for the, the children uh, that come in. Um, yes, so that, it, that there's the, it's normally 18 and up, but we, we, on Sundays we go about uh, 10 plus for family days. Okay, so. very cool. Um, and then if, if you go inside, do you have to throw or could you just go inside to use the upstairs area? Uh, no, you do not have to throw. You could just come into this location and um, go upstairs and, and just throw. See, and that's the difference from um, this location to the, the one in Tampa and the one we have. We don't have that luxury. You know, it's either we don't have that much space to, to do that where this would be able to accommodate that space for people to okay. come in and they don't have to throw. And then my, my only other question is, do those lanes, I couldn't really tell from the rendering, do those have roofs so I can't throw a hatchet at <coughs> somebody upstairs? Or is that like... <laughs> <laughs> Well, there there is no there's no roof on them, but the sides are 10 feet tall, um, and then in the at the front where the targets are, it extends even higher than that. So you you would really have to be trying to throw it outside <laughs> of the pit okay. in order to get it outside. Okay. And we will have a netting underneath the mezzanine, small enough to where things can't fall directly down. So uh, that will uh, be part of our safety protocol as well for the mezzanine. Sure. Okay, those are my only questions. Thank you guys very much. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Mayor. Um, you ready you to go play? Are you ready to go play? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I'm kind of sitting here and I do have a smile on my face. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, but I have to ask a couple of questions. Um, the, um, when, when are you opening? I guess I should ask for one. Do um, you have a build out to do yet, or is that correct? So, what's your time frame? Well, so right now we're in the final stages of the, the plans being drawn up. Uh, and then it'll go over to Kevin's uh, department. And, uh, and talking to him, he said that he would try to get this fast-tracked uh, through permitting so we can start the build-out right away. Build-out will take about two months. Two months once you get the permit in yeah. hand. So okay. we're, we're hoping beginning of the year. Yeah, you've got a good landlord, Mr. Kokolakis, um, over there. So Yeah, Will yeah. and his team, have, they've been awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah, And um, the other thing, 
I need to ask you, you're talking about 10 years old, 10 year olds, uh, you have little axes and big axes that you throw or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sir, they're, they're all the same size. It just like, normally we won't have 10, but like I said, we, we would stretch that if the parent feels that, but it's usually we've had 13, 13 years old and they, they're strong enough to do it, um, to go in there. And what's no, the distance? Have. What's the throw distance? It's, it's about 12 feet from the, the targets to, to the throwing. 12 feet? Yeah. yeah. So about, yeah. about the distance yeah that yeah here. okay and, and you don't have shorter distance or anything like that or just no. one distance okay no it's the all same right. all across the board in and the you, outside area um i, I just have a co and i'm sure there'll be um like our other cafes it'd be allowed drinking beer out there and things like that i think so um is that going to be fenced off or something out there or no I, I i would request and like to have it open as it is now right now it's open because there's parking spaces uh, we'll probably have a short border if we're doing, uh, say we're lining it with outdoor, that, sh that wicker, nice patio, loungers and things like that. Or we'll create some sort of short uh, barrier of some type so we can fasten taller uh, poles so we can have string lights. Uh, but okay. I really would not like to close it off, but keep it open for folks to see no, that no, it that's, is there. That's fine. I, I just didn't know. I guess the people pay for their drinks and things ahead of time, and they take it out there, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yes, and, then, and you'll be able to be out there and just walk to the bar and order any sort of beverage from okay. being outside with actually at, without having to go inside. And, uh, and I guess the other part is um, I know the indoors, you'll be watching it and things of that uh, nature, but the outside is um, uh, because you'll be picking up your drinks and bringing them out, um, you're will you have somebody that walks through there from time to time yeah we'll have a uh, just a server or, or okay. just another employee somebody to pick up right. things and Picking tables things, wait on tables maybe okay. offering to pick up drinks or, or order drinks things of that nature uh making sure there's not folks that are just kind of creating any havoc that they really don't need to be there you know we'll, we'll absolutely keep an eye because again it will hurt our establishment as well if we start letting certain things they, happen yeah, I guess what I'm meaning is you're you're actually wanting tar, uh, you want car customers to be there. You don't want um, you know. Uh, so the other thing, as far as bicycle racks, I should have asked this: if uh, are you planning on bicycle racks there as well? We have one there now, and then uh, we plan on putting a few more It'll that way. We can grow really as you go if you need right. to. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. We're gonna well, play you. on that trail quite a bit, so we'll make sure there's plenty of uh, stuff for the bikes and, and things like that, yeah. and animals. It's, it's a pretty neat concept. You see it on TV and other locations, so I'm kind of really interested in seeing how it's going to work out. This is Tarpon Springs, so it ought to be a Here's huge you. success. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing axes anyway, so. <laughs> All right, we'll thank you the guys. We'll have match uh, Tarpon Springs history as well. Right. Uh, yeah. Even though we do have to follow the franchise, we are able to incorporate, so we'll be reaching out to certain folks to get some certain uh, Tarpon Springs well, decor sponges and things well, like that. Let me ask you, can you bring your own hatchet or? <laughs> Um, yeah, yes, you can actually for leagues. We, we do league nights, and I think league nights is going to be a hit here. Um, but yes, you can bring your own hatch. We, we just prove it, but as long as it meets our standard, you can bring in your own. It, it just sounds uh, exciting. So, I mean, I'll be, uh, I'm a little old for this sort of thing, but I'll probably be out there throwing You'll have a good some time. things in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, we, Thank we you very much. see all you guys out there. Yeah, it's a good and, time. and just to clarify, it's the, these aren't axes that you would use right. to chop down trees. <laughs> these are, these are I understand. Hatches, smaller. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like in the last of Mohicans. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicants from the board? Seeing none, does staff have any questions for the applicants? No. The applicants have any last uh, statements they'd <coughs> like to make? No, we're just really excited to get get going and and uh, uh, and be a, you know another asset to Tarpon Springs. All right. Are there any public comments on this item? Madam City Attorney, I apologize. I wasn't intending on speaking on this, so I have not been sworn in. So, Okay, if you could raise your right hand. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So sworn. Uh, as somebody who lives, oh, sorry, Forte Culianas, 1185 South Pinellas Avenue, as somebody uh, who lives on the trail and rides the trail daily, and somebody who has been, uh, I have not been to a Stumpy's, but I have been to several uh, similar business models, I could not be more excited to hear about this, and I will definitely be uh, be a patron if this is approved. So I would encourage the commission, uh, if you want uh, some really exciting stuff to come to the city, if you have not been to one, this is definitely a, a very fun opportunity for all the residents and visitors of Tarpon Springs. Uh, so I just wanted to raise the, 
myself to the approval for this. Thank you so much. Any other public comment on this item? Protos, you have been sworn in, correct? Yes. Anita Protos, 901 Bayshore Drive. First of all, with Mr. DeMatos, <coughs> his father has been very successful in Pasco County. He has had one of the biggest, finest dental labs in the state of Florida. His mother is one of the most sought after, uh, uh, well-renowned surgical nurses in Florida. Everything they do is top notch and they cover every aspect of their developments and what they do. My excitement about having this in Tarpon is it's gonna bring money into our community and it's gonna bring people. But if they were lying to me, I'll find out now. They said if we have aggression against someone, we can bring a big poster picture of them and they'll put it up and we'll get the facts out. So I think that'll be very good for mental health and emotional health for all of us in Tarpon Springs. So I urge you to pass it. Thank you. I'll get mine just printed for you guys so you have it up there for everybody. Bonnie Audrey School Yas, 595 Peninsula Avenue. Uh, I think it's a great idea. It's, it's a <laughs> unique business that's coming to town. Uh, looking forward to having a couple beers over there, walking across the street, brighter days, going down to Tarpon Tavern, maybe going back and deciding to throw some hatchets. But um, what can we do to support this business long term? And the trail properties on both sides of the trail need to be zoned back to commercial, including the area from Lime Street down to Mears. We want to encourage uh, commercial buildings to go up over time in that area to create the walkability. They're one of the first people, one of the first businesses on the east side of the trail that you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna go visit to go hang out at. So um, let's help them out. Let's help rezone that trail area to create a walkability that's similar to surrounding cities. That way, uh, several years down the road, next thing you know, we have businesses popping up left and right. People are able to walk across each one of them, have a good nightlife, and uh, I think it can happen. Thanks. Any other public comment on this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. The chair will detain the motion. So moved as proposed by staff. Second. Are there any other additional comments, questions? I've got a couple comments. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, I mean, I'm super excited about this. I've been to Axe Learning before in the past. It's been very small, so I'm excited to see how big this space is. Uh, overall, it's going to be a great asset for our city. So people come to Tarpon Springs for the sponge docks and see some of the historic pieces, maybe go to a restaurant, but this gives them another thing to do. And that's, a, that's a one of the great things about this business. So I'm really grateful you guys are moving us forward and made the proposal. Uh, super, super excited about it. So it's just going to be one more thing to keep people here in Tarpon Springs. And it's also going to give people, like you mentioned, from the south to come up into Tarpon Springs or from Trinity to come into Tarpon Springs um, because Tarpon has so many different poles. So I really, really appreciate everything you've done. The design looks super quality. Um, super stoked about that um, overall. So um, as well, so you have Silver King now, it's down Lemon Street. You have Brighter Days, it's further up. Um, you've got multiple things along the strip on Tarpon Avenue. This is gonna be one more addition on the bike trail. So um, see the bike trail fill out, I think is really encouraging as well too. So whatever we can do, I, I hope you're aware of the grants that are out there. Um, I think there's a code grant, there's um, a, uh, a restaurant grant if you're doing anything food or beer wise and there's also um, a facade grant too so if you're doing anything outside make sure you're looking into those and also the city's current or the board's currently looking at a, um, a mural grant too um, so if you ever are interested in putting a mural that's something that's a matching grant all these are matching grants are not just money that we'll give but it's something that will match what you're doing what you're doing out there um, so Karen Lemons is the one you want to talk to about that, and she'll give you all the details. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's a great asset to our city. I'm really excited to, to be um, partake in it and have a fun spot to hang out. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? <coughs> yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. Good luck to you guys. Next, we'll go to item number 13, which is the resolution 2021-59, fiscal year 2021 budget resolution. City Attorney, if you please read the resolution, please. 
Resolution 2021-59, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2020-2021. Be resolved by the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, that the following amendments are made to the fiscal year budget of 2020-2021. Thank you, Mr. Haig. Looks like you're ready to give us the report. Yeah, I have nothing as exciting as hatchet throwing here, but <laughs> I, might, I might be buying one, though. Right, but. right. <laughs> Uh, budget resolution 2021-59 is being brought before you to budget for items that were not previously budgeted for in the fiscal year 2021 budget, the previous fiscal year. This will be the last budget resolution for fiscal year 2021. I've tried to list all the items in the, in the cover letter there. You know, the bulk of the items are for funding the city has received in the form of grants and insurance reimbursements. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Hay, we're going to go to public comments and we'll come back. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Here none. Um, Mr. Herrick, appreciate the meeting that we had yesterday on this item. <coughs> and for the benefit of the public, would you please elaborate on the COVID care uh, reimbursement, the $94,000, and also the COVID vaccine reimbursement that we got from the county? Correct. Which is not, which is different from the American Rescue Fund. Right, they're both different funding sources from the American Rescue Plan. And, you know, back when the pandemic started, a lot of the larger cities and counties, over 500,000 in population, received money through the federal government. You know, the smaller cities like ourselves didn't. So we were able to submit to the county for the under the COVID CARES for reimbursement for our expenses of the dealing with the pandemic. We received 524,000 from the county for reimbursement for those expenses related to the pandemic. And then after that, we've gotten the money from American Rescue Plan. Uh, the vaccine reimbursement is uh, the staff of the uh, fire department that have been, they were going, I think mostly last winter into the spring, you know, helping with vaccinations. The county re would re reimburse for their overtime for going down to, I think, down South City, down South County to provide those reimbursements. And that money came from the county. Thank you. Can I have a motion there for the motion? Uh, motion to approve resolution. Second. Uh, Vice Mayor, you got a comment? Yeah, just a couple comments. Um, first off with the COVID stuff, Mark and uh, Ron, thank you for keeping track of all this stuff. Um, obviously, we wouldn't be able to get the reimbursement if we didn't keep track of it diligently. So great job with that. I um, appreciate that. Uh, one thing that catches my eye is uh, insurance reimbursement and state funding, uh, Ron, for the street light maintenance. What is that? I don't recall that fund. We get we get money. Well, it's mostly it's the street lights out on the um, Highway 19, highway. and there's been more of them. I don't remember the count going from Tarpon Avenue, going the newer ones going up to the border, and there's been more maintenance on those lights. And we get you know sometimes people hit those lights and stuff and. When they do, we usually find them and we get the insurance reimbursements for the repairs that are required to fix those lights. Okay, so that's what the funding from insurance reimbursement and state funding. Okay, so it's insurance reimbursement from like an accident, someone running into it, and then state funding for the, the that's, okay. And that's a separate source Understood. of state funding. We went from the state. Two different things. I thought it was the same thing. That's what I was confused. No, no, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Sure. Any other comments? Any, Any comments? No. We need a motion. Uh, we got a motion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahuzas? Yes. The item number 14 is a resolution 2021 61 Sidewalk Improvements Fund. Mm -hmm. City Attorney, please read the resolution. Resolution number 2021 61, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida. <coughs> authorizing the withdrawal of up to $100,000 from the sidewalk improvement fund and providing for an effective date hereof. Staff report. Ryan, you gonna do that? Yeah, sure. Um, as you probably know, city charter section 26 requires that a resolution come before the board when using the monies from the sidewalk improvement fund. On November 2nd, uh, earlier this month, uh, the board approved 229,000 for sidewalk improvements, which meets the requirements of section 26 of the charter. The maximum during a year per the charter that can be taken from the sidewalk improvement fund is $100,000. And so we are requesting approval to re withdraw 100,000 from the sidewalk improvement fund. Thank you. 
Are there any public comments on this item? Hear none. Need a motion? So moved. Second. Any commission comments? Hey, excited about sidewalks. No. A roll call, please. Commissioner Vadikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. Now we're going to go back to uh, where we left off was item number six to approve the uh, cemetery uh, uh, monument rules revision. I'll start off while Paul comes up. Um, there was an item, there was an incident um, that came up about a monument that caused, that had a great deal of attention. Um, this is something that involved all three charter officials and of course Paul, um, Cheryl and the cemetery be under him. So almost everybody has had a little piece of this thing. The board directed us to go back and try to come up with a, a different version from the version that was in there. Um, again, the original version was one that was supported by all three charter officials. Um, and, you know, I think all of us to this day still think it's a good rule, but the board wanted to go back and see if there's any provisions to make it easier um, to be able to get a monument if the proper court documents or proper registration wasn't there. Um, so the group, mainly Irene, Paul, city attorney, um, developed these, and I'll turn it over to Paul. Um, to see what you're presenting the board as an alternative to the present rules and regulations um, for the monuments. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. The board has directed city staff to draft revisions to the rules and regulations of Cicadia Cemetery regarding owner authorization requirements for the installation of memorials or monuments on grave spaces. Specifically, the board is considering adding a process for family members of certain eligible relation as defined by state statutes and with consent of all surviving family members to be able to install a cemetery memorial or monument. The city clerk's office and the public services department worked with the city attorney to develop draft rule revisions for board review and approval. A draft of the proposed revisions to the rules is provided in the backup as a line and strike format. Also attached are new forms that the clerk's office would utilize to complete the process with the required documentation. That's my presentation, Mayor. Thank you. We'll go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Good evening. Thank you, Mike Eisner, 1515 Riverside Drive. I think when this was brought up last time, I was in agreement to uh, change the wording on this so that the person out of respect could have a cemetery plot with a uh, name on it. And um, I'm just glad that we've made that decision to move ahead with it. And if there's any issues with these down the road, you can always remove it. So I'm just glad that we've uh, seen the light. Thank you. Any other public comments? Hear none. You need a motion? Motion to approve as proposed by staff. Okay. Good. Second. Uh, we've got a commission comments. Vice Mayor, I appreciate that you're bringing this forward. And uh, as Mr. LeCourtis stated earlier, we had a situation that a family member had a uh, hardship because they could not provide a proof of ownership for their uh, father's gravesite. So uh, in order to install the, uh, the monument, uh, with these revisions now, um, the cemetery rules will be easier for unusual situations. I have a question to our city attorney, Mr. Jello. Is the uh, city will have any liability even though that the family members will have, will provide letters of no objection to the city? Um, no, because in addition to the letters of no objection, they are required to execute a, a release and hold harmless agreement, which would, um, which would provide a, basically a waiver of liability for the city in the event that anything were to happen, if there was a disagreement with the monument or if there was any type of damage uh, to either property or person uh, in relation to the monument. Good, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Vice Mayor Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, this was brought to my attention by a local news station, and I had a chance to talk to the um, individual. And I also talked to um, another monument installation company. I believe he spoke publicly last time. 
And um, there was multiple examples that have been in the past that this has come up and there have been issues um, where individuals couldn't put something on the gravesite, which I think everyone deserves some type of recognition in a gravesite. It shouldn't be an unmarked grave. Um, so this is, I think, the, the just the, the right thing to do. Um, I think it's a respectful to the family. I think it's respectful to the individual that passed away um, to give at least a bare minimum um, with a name, date of birth, date of death, place of birth, and then city where, the, where they're from um, to be able to go on the monument uh, and avoid probate and any additional costs that, may, that they may cause. Um, obviously, if they still want to do like a larger monument, uh, if they want to do different things on the monument itself, they would have to get through probate. Um, if there's not a joint owner, is my understanding, of the plot itself. Um, I would also like to thank staff for bringing this back uh, timely. Um, and I think it's I think it's a benefit to the city. Again, this is one of the things that this is the residents came to to us as a board and asked for something different to have a little more leniency. Um, and then what I learned also is that the city of Tarpon Springs is one of the only cemeteries locally that has a rule something along those lines too. So I do think it's a good idea to uh, move forward with it, and uh, I think it's going to be beneficial to um, the individuals and the residents of the city. So thank you. Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, again, for bringing this forward. Um, this is something where we touched on it last time. I think we were all in agreement that it needed to be more flexible. You know, the last thing you want to deal with when you're dealing with burying a family member is city bureaucracy or city limitations. So um, I really like the way this is written. My only question is on number two. Uh, it says the requester will also provide letters of no objection from all other living family members of the descendant. Does that seem kind of unenforceable? I mean, is there a verification process that staff is going to go through to say, hey, all living family members have been contacted? And then also, who does that, you know, is that cousins, second cousins? Is that just, you know, mom, dad? Um, I just feel like that one's kind of vague. And I, I just think that, I, again, I think it's a good ordinance. I'm happy to approve it. I'm just wondering, as far as number two goes, how we would even begin to say, you know, if somebody walks in and says, well, there were no other living family members, are we going to try to verify that, or is that just something we're taking at value because we're protected legally? I'm going to ask Irene if she could help me with that answer. Her office does those sorts of interactions with the customers. and. Um, I think in our discussions, the really the only way for us to verify that is if we had some type of, um, if there was an obituary in it. Let's say there is five children and one of the children wanted to place the monument, um, then they would have, but it, it, otherwise the only other way would be, it would be the responsibility of the requester to let us know and we really wouldn't have no way of fully knowing. Okay. Uh, do you remember anything additional from our discussion? Well, and you just got to remember, it's the, it's the, it's just, it's not your entire family from cousins. It's those specific five or six that are able to do this. So mother, father, it's, it's not the whole family line. So. And it would depend on the situation. Yeah. Uh, and again, this would protect us if the person lied and there was a problem later from us. Again, we'd still be protected so they didn't do it. So you're only talking about the list of people who could do this surviving spouse, child, brother, or sister. So that's usually pretty easy from an obituary or something to check those out. And, and at least, you know, without the uh, approval of the owner, the only thing they would be allowed to place anyway would just be, um, like Vice Mayor uh, noted, they would just be able to put a name, a date, a date of birth, the place they were born, things like that. They wouldn't be able to put any kind of other additional inscriptions, any other different, uh, pictures, anything like that. Okay. I mean, would, uh, that's, that's one that I might be open to removing or changing just in general, just because I think we're so covered by the other four. Again, I think it's great revisions, and I think the other four really cover the city to hold us harmless. Um, but number two is just so hard to prove. I mean, how are you going to bring that up? You know, is that going to be something where somebody comes in and says, hey, I got the letter here, and then you say, well, actually, I read your obituary, and it says you have a third cousin, or not a third cousin, but, uh, you know, one other brother that lives in California you've never talked to. Um, I, I just think that's that we're kind of creating, like, an unenforceable rule or an unverifiable rule with that. So, again, I, I appreciate staff's effort on this. I, I think it's a great revision overall. Um, and I, I get, if you want to keep it in there, I'll, I'll still support it. I just think that's something that's going to be really hard to enforce and I don't want to put that on on staff to do 
Well, let me go a little further. One of the main reasons that was put in is the unforeseen problem. Um, one of the reasons why the staff supports how it was, um, you don't have families that are all in agreement all the time. So the biggest problem you would have with not restricting it is siblings, um, you know, differences in opinion of, of without the probate, who is the authority? You got five sisters or brothers and there's a dispute about what can do. This, this was an attempt um, to alleviate those because they would have to sign off and then you, where are you gonna get into disputes about the city had no right to let the oldest put something there without considering what the youngest was. So the reason this is so important is this is the one area that we don't run into if it's probated or there's a decision, who is the decision maker on a plot? And believe me, the situations I read and seen, um, I've had one in my own family, uh, the disputes about who puts what on people's graves can get very nasty and it puts us in the middle of family fights that we don't need to be in. So to me, that's one of, this is one of the most important aspects um, to get those signed off so it avoids the city being in the middle of a, of a, of a sibling or some other relation of these immediate people who can make that decision and their family disputes, which are more often than you know, and I'm sure Irene can attest to because she's usually in the middle of them. Okay. Uh, again, I, I support it either way. I understand the sentiment, and if it's to protect us, it's to protect us, but I really don't want, you know, I don't want employees to have to pour through obituaries and call people out for maybe having a sibling that they may or may not have. So if, if that's in there to cover us and we're fine moving forward with it, okay, but um, I, I, don't, I just don't want that to be a sticking point in the future. That's all I got, thanks. Commissioner T. Curtis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, well, there is a number of what ifs <laughs> that you can go through that this breaks down. And uh, I, I, it's just, if they happen, we'll just have to deal with them as they go. Um, the question I had was, um, if, 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 um, there's two, th actually three things. One, if someone changes their mind, then after they give uh, their, in other words, anybody that's surviving, that's based on this definition of um, uh, spouse, relative, et cetera, has to give their approval. If they, if they will withheld, if they withhold approval, does that mean that the monument doesn't go in? That's my understanding is that all of these have to be satisfied for the clerk's office to accept the request. Is, is that right, city manager, yes. of course? That, that's good. Yes. I mean, I don't have an issue with that. I just want clarification on it. Yes. Okay. Um, number two, um, we have in there that um, that the we're, we're um, well. Let me read it from the front. It is embedded in there. Basically. Um, the requester will sign the hold harmless identification agreement in favor of the city holding the city harmless identifying the city from for any claims made by the owners of the grave site and for the installation. Um, shouldn't there be something in there about the monument installer as well? In other words, if, if for whatever reason, whoever <laughs> the requester is decides to contract with uh, a, a, you know, a, a monument provider and the monument provider puts this in there for whatever reason and he comes back with some kind of a claim. Is there any claim on the part of the city by, by having allowed to do this? I would, <laughs> I would say that they, the city would not necessarily be in privity of contract with the monument installer because the monument installer would be contracting with the requester. Um, so that there, there wouldn't really be any liability on the part of the city to the monument installer. That would be something that would be between the, between the requester and the monument installer. So we shouldn't be worried about any kind of issues between the requester, who by the way is not the owner, um, contracting and having son done something on, on this property. And um, that's what I hear you saying and that we shouldn't worry about that. No, because in, in the only example I can really think of is if the monument installer does uh, install something and there is a dispute between the monument installer and the requester, and the monument installer comes back and tries to sue the city 
we have the release and hold harmless agreement from the requester whom the monument installer contracted with. Once that's presented, the city is absolved of having to defend itself if there was even anything to defend, which and I couldn't see so how there would be. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll trust our staff. If you see a problem with that, you'll come back on that. Uh, okay. The other question I have is that um, in, the, um, in the change of the uh, rules, uh, paragraph 2, uh, it starts out, if the owner of the grave site is deceased and his or her estate has not been probated, okay, and you go down to the middle of the second paragraph, it starts out, if the requester is not the owner or has not received permission from the owner, well, the requester is not going to be the owner because the owner will have been deceased and his estate will not have been probated. Instead of having stating that, why isn't there some reference back to paragraph 2 if the requester, as defined in paragraph 2, um, if the requester as defined in paragraph two, uh, something along the line, the memorial monument will be limited to the following information. I mean, it just seems to me that we're saying that you're not the owner, but then later saying if you are not the owner, then we're going to, you know, we're going to allow you to do this. So um, there is no reference to paragraph two. I, I guess it would be a legal question if you don't see. Ms. Aguilo, if you don't see an issue with that either, I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, um, no, I think because it's it's two different situations. You're talking about if the owner is deceased, and then in the second one you're talking about if the owner is not the owner or has not received permission from the owner. Um, so the owner could be somebody who is other than the deceased, and the requester could be somebody different. Um, That's correct. On behalf of the owner. So, so we're okay with that, the yeah. way it's written? Okay. Is that correct? Because if the owner gives permission to someone and the, one of the owners is living and gives permission to someone, then they can put up whatever type of monument because the owner's given them permission. If it was a non-owner and the, you know they didn't go through probate or anything, then they would, only, they would be limited to just that, what we are allowing them to put. Okay. No, that's fine because it's all under the same paragraph. Uh, that's why I was questioning that. All right, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I don't like making changes like that. I can understand the situation. The city manager knows how I feel about it, um, and, but that's okay. I, 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 I'm willing to give this one a try and, and see if it helps, and if it doesn't, uh, if it creates issues, we'll be back talking about it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Irene, you too. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Vaticiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahuzas? Yes. Okay, now we're going to uh, item number seven. Number seven is a request for the Board of Commissioners to proceed with the resolution to uh, allocate allocation of code enforcement fine revenue. And that was uh, requested by Vice Mayor Carr. Vice Mayor Carr, you want to present this item? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, We've talked about this in budgets past, and we've talked about it more in detail this past uh, budget season as well, too. Um, and overall, in the history uh, of TARPON that I'm aware of is that the code enforcement funds are collected based on liens or fines put on a city's prop or a, a individual's property because they're not maintaining it. They're not following a code for some reason. Um, it's generally going to be a blight to the neighborhood of some sort. So the city's collecting the funds after it goes through the process. And then it would go into the general fund. And once it's in the general fund, it's not really assigned to anything. It would potentially be used for something that comes up later on. Uh, but what I, would, what I proposed this past budget season is that it would go towards, I believe, the uh, beautification projects, parks, and land preservation. So ultimately, you're taking the fines from a piece of property that's blighted, and then you're doing something good with it, and you're trying to uplift the city with those funds that you're receiving. Um, so the proposal that I would like to recommend would either split it between beautification parks and land preservation. Uh, I do think to put a, a bigger emphasis on land preservation because there's not really a way to fund that currently. Um, so I would make a suggestion of like a quarter beautification, a quarter for parks, and half of it, um, half of it for land preservation. And just to bring up talking about beautification a little bit more, um, like this could go, 
I would like to see, like this could even go as far as like pressure washing our sidewalks on Pinellas Avenue. If you look at Pinellas Avenue between like Orange Street and um, Live Oak and then even going all the way to Mears, um, it's constantly, it has like algae and like black, gray growth on there. Um, when it rains, it gets really slick. Um, and it seems like that's an issue that we have uh, from a staffing level. Maybe we could hire someone to actually pressure wash our sidewalks. So one, it's an aesthetic uplift, and then secondly, it's a safety increase as well. Um, but the, I think the really important part is also funding the land preservation fund because there's not a mechanism to fund that outside of a sale of a property. And we're not really in the real estate business. We're not selling property as a city that I'm aware of all that often. Um, and I think it's important that we find these pieces of property that we can buy, um, but we have to be able to fund it somehow. So that's ultimately what I'd like to do is kind of codify this, uh, to have this for future years, um, and then kind of get the board's opinion on what they would want to see the funds to go to if there's some other aspect. Uh, I just think it's important that we put it somewhere, and I think it's good to kind of do the opposite of what the code enforcement funds were collected of. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? <laughs> good evening again. Mike Eisner, 1515 Riverside Drive in uh, driving around town. Um, we have Beth on code enforcement, and she's doing an amazing job. I compliment her every time I see her, um, but we could use another Beth. So why can't we take these funds and put it back into hiring somebody else? Um, I think what she's doing is kind of overwhelming for her. Uh, we could use the help, uh, whether it be on part-time. Um, I just think that when you get money from one thing, you should kind of try to put it back into that same place that it's coming from. It'll just, it adds money to the city. Um, it keeps people in line. Um, there's, there's a lot of situations around town where people are doing what they want to do, and that's what we need the code enforcement for. So I'm, my vote is to kind of put the money back into rehiring another Beth who's doing an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Hi, Craig Lunt, 743 Chesapeake Drive. Um, I'm going to reiterate some of what Mike said. This is not a whole terrible lot of money um, that's left over. We do uh, probably need more code enforcement than we're getting out of our, our current personnel because they're taxed as it is. Um, I think we need to put this extra money in a code enforcement fund. We have code enforcement expenditures, but we need to have a, a fund for them that can grow so that maybe we can hire another code enforcement person. Our city is growing. The population is growing. Code enforcement needs to be picked up. As you drive around the city, there are many places where you see the code is shy. I see it on my street almost on a, and I live on a pretty short street, almost on a weekly basis. So somebody needs to pay more attention to this. The only way we can do that is to grow our code enforcement department. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Bonnie Ochoa, 595 Peninsula Avenue. I've received a couple of calls about anonymous tips going into the, the code enforcement department, um, considering roll offs and stuff that people are using for construction and uh, um, from some of the people's responses that they weren't gonna go look into it, but the board and the code enforcement officer and staff needs to be aware they still need to go do proactive calls when it comes to getting tips like that. Doesn't mean you have to go follow up right away that same day, but if a dumpster's sitting out there for a couple weeks and no one's tagged it, are we really being proactive? And are we really being fair towards the other uh, companies that offer roll-offs? So just something to consider. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, none. We uh, need a motion. I make a motion to, I mean, you're asking for a recommendation for a resolution, is that right, city manager? Yes. Move forward with writing a resolution. Yeah, I mean, I'll make a recommendation to the city staff that we move forward with writing a resolution um, using code enforcement funds 
uh, to be allocated to certain specific um, funds within the city. Okay. I'll second that for discussion. All right. Well, Vice Mayor, I understand your wish. Uh, now, this year the revenue minus the uh, expenditures is only 25000 which has been assigned to uh, for beautification. The expenses this year for the court enforcement is $110,000. Some years the revenue is just enough to cover the expenses. Um, I really don't want to tie down the, uh, the, the, uh, the hands of the future boards. Um, the elected officials are elected by the people of Tarper Springs to be able to have the latitude to make decisions. Um, I don't think we should put any restrictions to that. If we need more employees, they look at it and see if we, we need to hire somebody during the, uh, uh, during the budget process. Um, to tie down the, uh, the hands of uh, elected officials with $25,000, I don't see that to be a, a, a good way to do that. So I'm not in favor of doing this. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Uh, Commissioner Donovan, you got the light on. Yeah, I had, I just had some additional questions. I don't I don't know that I can comment on that. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify the background is is just a page here. So, is that are are you suggesting, Vice Mayor, that it be all used for beautification and it no longer covers the expenditures, or are you just asking for whatever's left over after expenditures are covered be split up or put into beautification use? Can I answer that. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so um, what was discussed, and to give you a little more background in the past too, so there's certain years that we, like as a city, has experienced a significant amount of revenue from the code enforcement funds. So it'd be like if there's a foreclosure situation and you're bringing in like $80,000 from a bank or $100,000. So there's some years where it's like the city could go gangbusters. I don't, I don't know even know what that means. So do really well, right, on the code enforcement funds. And then there's some years that might not make anything. Um, but yes, the discussion with the city manager with this vast budget season um, was that it would cover the expenditures of the code enforcement uh, department as itself. So it would be um, abatement, it would be city attorney fees, and it would also be um, the staff position, I believe. Is that right? I believe so. Ron, Ron did a piece of backup. He can clarify those on how he placed in the budget based on our budget meetings. But he mentioned, I think he mentioned all, did, did he miss one of the ones that, on that list, Ron? Yeah, that backup, that sheet of paper we, we got to all the, that's when we were working on the budget process this summer and stuff. Yeah, that's when we calculated the, uh, you know, the revenues and then the expenditures, the operating expenditures of the code enforcement department, the um, city attorney fees, lot clearing, and then the code enforcement officer, and obviously the revenues, 135,000 minus the expenditures of 110,000 left to 25,351, which when we're working on the budget, we budgeted that 25,000. It's in the budget right now, that 25,351 mark for beautification. Okay. Yeah, I mean, typically with code enforcement, um, you know, you're, you're citing somebody due to blight due to something unsightly, due to something unsafe. Uh, so I understand the logic of wanting to put it back into beautification. I think we need to be careful when it comes to reoccurring expenses with the code enforcement. I mean, revenues and expenditures are pretty much breaking even each year. They're barely keeping up with each other. So even if you saved up enough money to hire another Beth, that's a reoccurring cost. I mean, we can come up with $60,000 this year, but what about next year? That's not going to add up. So I like the idea of it going towards beautification. I think it helps justify the work that our code enforcement does. I, I think it, it makes it seem like less out to get people. It makes it seem like more so, hey, this is something that's unsightly or unsafe. We're going to put it back into making our city look better. Um, so this is something I'd, I, would, I would support. Commissioner Tsikiotis. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. A um, <coughs> couple of things. I hope you remember all my points. Um, Mayor, first of all, thank you for your consideration on those comments about tying the hands of uh, future boards and things of that nature. I very much appreciate that. Um, secondly, um, we've got a very good code enforcement officer, um, and, and um, I, I'm sure she's overworked in her position, and, and I'm hoping that, and I, it's not even a hope, I know 
Chief Young um, would let us know if he needs some help in that regard as well. So I, I don't want <clears throat> an excellent employee to burn out because we're overworking her, uh, and I understand that. So I, I, we've got a good police chief, and I'm sure he'll communicate any uh, anything like that before it happens. Um, I, I think the comments from the candidates uh, for the election coming up are excellent. I think they give a different look of things. Um, I do know that personnel costs are going to be a challenge in the future. The city manager and I have <laughs> conversations about this whenever I ask him to call me. It's generally about that. Um, I don't think money is the issue for beautification. I think it's manpower. and. Um, you know, we had that big discussion about the mangroves. We had to contract those out. If you go down uh, Pinellas Avenue, I don't even think pressure washing is issue. We've still got the tree wells that need to be fixed. We've got the uh, plant, uh, the planters that are supported on the lamp posts that need to be uh, reseeded with plants and watered. We're moving into the uh, into the, into the uh, festive season, and I think we should look our best. So there's a number of things that need to be done, and, um, and, and there's no shortfall of that, but I just don't think that just putting money towards something is gonna cure the problem. We've got $300,000 in the tree fund. I said, y'all heard me talk about trees on Pinellas Avenue. We've still got the uh, downtown uh, beautification plan that was not this budget that we just approved, but the previous budget that was approved, and we haven't even gotten back to that yet. And um, uh, so there, there's some challenges there that, uh, uh, again, I appreciate what um, the thought is behind this, but I also understand it's gonna vary from year to year. And finally, uh, before I would support anything like this, and Mary, you've heard me say this before, if, if this was, I, initially I thought this was just for the, this particular year, but it's earmarked for the 25,000 already for beautification, so I don't think that's an issue. It's just to implement some kind of a policy, and, and I've said this before, before we have policies implemented, and we've got an, a standing advisory board that is there to advise us on these policies. I'd like to see something like this go back before the Budget Advisory uh, Committee and have them um, provide us their thoughts on it. Um, it doesn't sound like we're gonna need to do that tonight. I'm, I'm not willing to support this at this time and, um, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor Carr, you had another? Yeah, I just, I just wanna bring up, um, I mean, as we said as a board, we vote constantly about, when it's, we're not restricting any future board's hands. Uh, one reading and it's changed, it's a resolution. So that's what the recommendation is about a resolution. Just like ordinances and resolutions, we've all said they could be changed. Um, I mean, if, if we forget about beautification, I mean, we've got areas for parks and we've got areas for land preservation that we don't fund today. So these are areas that I was trying to recommend of other ways to put money in those accounts. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the residents have been very clear they're interested in land preservation, but we don't have fun we don't have funding set aside for that. We have an account in our city's um, in our city bank accounts for land preservation, but there's no way to fund it. And so this would be a way to fund it. Uh, granted, it, it might not be funded some years, but then other years it might be funded a significant amount, depending on how it falls. So. That's all I'm bringing up, and I think it's a good idea, but if I don't have the support from the, the rest of the board, I mean, I'm happy to move on and work on other things, but in no way this doesn't restrict any future board. You can do a change in one reading, and it's it's uh, changed uh, in one reading, so. Commissioner Dow, you have another comment? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to emphasize that. It's not about stepping on any future board's toes. Um, I mean, we make decisions up here every single night, and if it's not included in one of our long-range plans or the city charter, Future board can come up here the first meeting and change pretty much every decision that we make up here. Um, so it's it's not about that at all. I think it makes sense logically, um, and I I don't think it's a, a concern for future boards if they don't like it they can change it. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Vaticiotis. No. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Carr. Yes. Mayor Lahuzas. No. So the motion dies. And we go to addendum, which is a discussion of potential projects for state appropriation 
for fiscal year 22 and 23. Staff report. Yeah, let me let me start and uh, first of all apologize for this coming at such <laughs> short notice. Um, I want to also thank Vice Mayor Carr because this is a very passionate issue of Vice Mayor Carr and uh, of course dealing with our state legislatures. He contacted us and uh, we had originally planned based on the schedules that we've had to bring this to the board in December. Um, but after I talked to Vice Mayor Carr and we wanted to look into some things, uh, we had checked with late last week, we had found out uh, by contacting um, Representative Sproul's office that the deadlines have been moved up because of the session being earlier. And in the last week, late Friday, um, we were told that we need to have to get this in by Wednesday. And by Wednesday, I'm meaning Wednesday tomorrow. So that's the reason for the short notice and, and the addendum um, because we have to finish up everything and, and bring it tomorrow. Uh, we'll go, Bob will go in and talk to Buddy's talk with Sproul's office, what he told us about the project submitted and give a, a, a brief overview of the, the two projects that we submitted last year that we didn't get that um, Representative Sproul's office indicated that uh, bring forward again and obviously we've done the paperwork so there's no problem meeting the tomorrow deadline for that so with that take it just to give an introduction go ahead and take it Bob and thanks Mark uh, Bob Robertson project administration department director um, Mark stole all my thunder no, I'm just teasing um, so uh, as Mark said uh, we're presenting items uh, to the board tonight for uh, appropriations <laughs> project request for state funding for construction um, as Mark said, normally we would have brought this to you a little earlier, but the session got moved up. Um, the, the staff from uh, Speaker of the House Sprouse's uh, office was able to help me, and we put those application packages together, the drafts I put in your backup. Um, so I'm going to summarize those two projects that were requested, but first I need to make an update on one item in the backup memo. In, in the memo, I, I stated that additional projects may be presented tonight and will be discussed tonight in addition to these two. Uh, today I was directed by uh, Speaker Sproul's staff to submit only those two projects. They only wanted to see those two. Um, those are the two projects that didn't make the cut last time around, so they want us to focus on just those two. So those two projects, a uh, summary of those two projects is as follows. Uh, first is the MLK South Spring Intersection Improvements Projects. Project, excuse me. For this project, the city would fund the design portion, which is about $140,000 and we would request um, just over 473,000 from the state for the construction phase. Uh, project design is just getting started and the final design concept has not yet been approved by the board nor presented yet to the public for input. So the final geometry of the intersection design is yet to be determined. There was an error, an artifact I had in that memo that states it would be a roundabout. That is not where we've go we're going yet. It's, the options are still to be determined. Uh, so different designs will be presented, and thank you, Mayor, for catching that, that error and bringing it to my attention today. <clears throat> the second project is the second phase of Mango Street. Um, we're calling it the Mango Street Safety and Drainage Improvements Project because the project would provide drainage improvements, wider and safer vehicle travel lanes, bike lanes, uh, crosswalks, and a six-foot sidewalk, basically an extension of what the work is already going on out there right now. Um, a city match of $69,000 would be, would be provided to cover the remaining design costs, and we would be requesting $625,000 from the state for the construction phase. So a total of uh, just under $1.1 million is the, is the request with a $209,000 match uh, in the form of funding uh, the design. So that's the summary of the two projects, and again, uh, we've been instructed to submit only these two, and that's it, Mayor, back to you. Thank you. We're going to go over public comments on this item. Good evening again. Mike Eisner, 1515 Riverside Drive. Um, I heard city manager say that he is apologizing for getting this out kind of late. But uh, bottom line, that's for the way it's been for the last number of emails prior to the BOC meeting. So I don't know if that's fair to be you know, for you guys or for the candidates to get things the last minute like that and not have the time to research. But moving on from there, um, I did read that it was a roundabout, which I kind of, I know, I, I understand. 
now that's been clarified, but that would be kind of the silliest idea we could do to put over there. Um, I don't know why we don't have somewhat of a preliminary um, plan of looking at this to just raise the sidewalk and to raise the, um, the, the, dr the drive area, raise the sewers, um, and possibly even put in a vault system where the water down MLK can be funneled back if we get a heavy rain on top of a high tide. I know this idea is not going to work if there's a hurricane or a heavy duty uh, uh, type storm, but for the everyday high tides, the king tides we have, it would, be, it would work like a charm. I don't think that we should have anything more coming off the bridge. We should be doing a right lane, a right turn lane only, not going to pineapple and not going to spring. And we shouldn't have pineapple going across either and the traffic would pick up immensely. I think anything we do there, we should be very careful. We don't start flooding the Afton apartments um, because it's, it's very easy to do. It's very low over there. So I've been there for a number of high tides and king tides, and it's about six or eight inches that we have to deal with on the most part. And that could be done very easily with just raising like I said, the sewers, the street, and the sidewalks. And in closing, um, there is other areas that we also have to deal with. Nothing has been done with uh, Hope Street with uh, Sophie Constantine's uh, flooding problem as well. So I just wanted to remind that to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? Craig Lunt, 743 Chesapeake. Um, I kind of agree with Mike on the, the MLK termination and raising it. We need to be really careful about flooding the, the streets to the north of that because they're very, very low. And I think right now they're actually looking like they, they sit underneath that. Um, I'm actually more concerned about the mango extension. Um, I'm concerned because uh, as I walked the distant area the other day, it looks like the whole mayor's drive to mango entire thing is an unfinished project there's no sidewalks there's a church on the corner of Diston and and mayors there's no crosswalks the lighting is poor that whole area looks like it was it was half thought through and and half done so if we're going to look at redoing or putting some more money into the into the mango area we ought to look at running that to the west and making sure that we have sidewalks down in the Pinellas Trail, that we have crosswalks because there's a school a block away, that we have adequate facilities to, to have people coming to that church in and out that, that it, as far as lighting and crosswalks. It's, none of this is done. The only thing that's been done there is flashing stop signs, and I'm just afraid that just doesn't cut it. Thank you. Mayor, may I ask a point of order, please? May I ask a question for clarification? Yeah. Are we doing, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what our, our um, uh, objective is here. Are we to prioritize these two projects? No, no it's not. And what are we supposed to do just? Well, today it's what I was going to explain after the public comments is, the uh, staff is just requesting authorization to request for funding from the state on those two projects that was recommended by uh, the Speaker of the House. Those two projects was the uh, on the list, if you remember last year, right. that I worked with the uh, uh, Speaker of the House, right. and we got funded for the two projects, the Attorney Basin on the Anklo River, and also the uh, flooding on the Dagon East, that we got funded for that. Those two uh, projects was left out, so this is the two projects that we're going to submit this year again. If um if there's a preferred one, it's not our role to identify which one would be preferred for Speaker Sprouse, or it's just up to the to the legislature as far as which one they would support or approve. Those two projects are the ones that we actually uh, had identified last year. They already know about it, and it's going to be easier for them to, uh, you know, uh, identify them again for uh, for funding. 
as you know, that uh, the Speaker of the House is going to ask one of the other representatives to, uh, to sponsor it because the Speaker of the House doesn't do it himself. So, so the idea would be either to, be get, to get both of them or none of them? To get both of them at, yeah, at the same time. We have a very good uh, chance to get both of them. And if we don't get both, then, and they're willing to do one, do we provide them input on that, or is they, they choose well, which one? Right now, I, wanna, I don't want to say that. I want to say that they're both equally important. Okay. So All right. let's All not right. do that. Let's not give a way out. Thank you. You know, let's just say that both of those projects are very important. So we're going to push both of them to be done at the same time, to get funding for both of them. Okay, if thank I, you. If we just tell them that one is more important than the other one, you know they're going to work on one and not the other. It's the, it's the way it's been. Let's work for both. We're going to go back to the public comments. Thank you, Mayor. Here to Lex 514 Ashland Avenue. Who keeps bringing up this issue about a roundabout That's at not the bridge? There. It was a mistake. It was not there. It's in, when I looked at the backup earlier today, that was part of the language in there. Is it language not still stayed in there? And the funding request roundabout? Can you answer that? Has that been removed? Because what I saw online with the backup for that request still says roundabout. <laughs> That's the worst place to put a roundabout. Uh, you know, people in Florida are not familiar with roundabouts. Maybe you go to Europe or some places where they've had them for years and years and years. That's, it's, it's not a functional place to put a roundabout. First off, you don't have enough room for it. So what are you gonna do? Mr. Donovan here, he didn't like eminent domain, so are you gonna not take some of the corner pieces there on Pineapple or on the, on the southeast corner of MLK? And then we own, the city owns that little triangular piece of property, part of it, that'll be all gone. In order to have a roundabout, you need a pretty big diameter, and that intersection doesn't do it. And if anything, it's one intersection that people do know how to use as a multi-way stop, just like Safford and MLK here. It's the same thing. People are familiar with how to approach and proceed through that intersection. And then you start getting a roundabout at the northern terminus of a bridge i just don't make sense y'all keep bringing up these little projects that don't make sense uh bonnie Cuyas, 595 peninsula avenue uh, our staff is more than capable of coming up with design plans to not include a runabout um, You've heard from the residents plenty of times. That was one of the first citizen engagement posts that just popped off the charts where the citizens opposed it. So once in a while, let's just try to listen to the citizens. You know, it, it's their town too. Um, and re regarding uh, stakeholders and, and comp plans, just wanted to bring this up. Someone who has a vision sometimes doesn't know how to strategize to get to that vision. So think about the stakeholders regarding strategic planning in the future. These people need to have the energy and the wit and the ability to help give, uh, uh, to help give their uh, uh, strategies. Now, the um, Mango Street. So we're asking for these funds to extend the road and and that, I understand that was phase two, going back to the Mears extension. Um, why do we need those additional funds if that project was supposed to be done with the phase two part? And I know people are trying to push through distant, 
I oppose it. I don't think those roads north of that intersection are even able, even ready to handle 130% increase in traffic flow. Uh, you're basically just getting people from Pasco to come right through and they're either gonna turn west towards uh, on MLK back to the intersection or they're gonna turn east down to US 19. But they cannot, distant from MLK to Tarpon Ave, cannot handle any increase in traffic. Go look how small those roads are. So I understand you guys wanna extend distant, but make sure all those roads in that area are redone, widened out, taken care of to uh, be able to take this influx of people in that are gonna be driving through. And um, that's really it, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, there's no more comments. Just clarification. Tonight, uh, this item here is only to get authorization to request funding from, uh, from the state on those two projects. We're not doing any designing, none of that. In regards to uh, turnabout, it's been clarified that it's not going to be included it was already very clear from the people that don't want it, and Mr. Robbins already explained that was just a mistake. So, it has been corrected. Um, we need a motion. We'll still have comments, commission comments, is that right? Make, yeah, we need a motion. Then. Make a motion to approve as uh, presented by staff with the correction of removal of the roundabout and the backup. Second. Commission. Commissioner uh, Vatikior, you had a question to ask? Yes, thank you. Um, was, was, the, was this the packet that was sent last time to the uh, to uh, Speaker Sprouse? No, that's a new packet. This is a new packet? Yes. Okay. Um, and and so in addition to the front, it's also in this paragraph 12 as far as a roundabout, so that'll get corrected, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Um, I had uh, a couple of things. One, a, uh, Commission, can I interrupt you for a second? The package that we had the last time that was hand delivered by me, which was prepared by the staff, if you remember, that was part of the package as well. I just want to make sure that no, was No, I, I know, but I was thinking maybe that was the reason why the roundabout was included. It was just a, a figment no. from the yeah. last time. So I was trying to help Mr. Robertson, Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, no. I was trying to help Mr. Robertson on that one. So. <laughs> Um, I had already talked to the city manager about this particular project of roundabout versus not roundabout this today. So um, the, um, the, the question I had was uh, in primarily, if you go to the Mango Street, um, and, and it's actually got to do with paragraph uh, item 16 on the application, the appropriation, and that's for both of them actually. Um, if you go to um, item 16 for Mango Street, for example, um, and the reason why I like this being included for this is because it, it is, it kind of does close off this project. I mean, I, once this is done, the, the stormwater improvements on Mango, that should be it for fixing that area, right? With right. the exception of some additional sidewalk and other things of that nature. Okay. Um, if you look at 16, why is it that it says the project, it says, is there any documented show of support requested the project in the community, including public hearings, letter support, major organizational backing, and other expressions of support? This Mango Street is, is actually referred specifically in our transportation element, the comp plan, to have something done as far as multimodal improvements. I would think that some reference to our comp plan that's been in there for a long time would go a long way to strengthening that uh, application. Um, I can add that. And it's also uh, part of our utilities element of the comprehensive plan as well in terms of stormwater and our goals and objectives with that as well. So um, I, I just think that there's some other areas in here and, and I, it almost seems like Ms. Vincent hasn't taken a look at this from, or maybe she has, but. She's, she would be very good as far as picking some things out of our comprehensive plan to add to that to strengthen the application. Okay. Um, I, I, that, and, and then again, I said it, it specific, specifically references 
mirrors. It doesn't refer to Mango because it's an assumed, it's mirrors all the way right. out to US 19. Yes. So, but this is what we're talking about. So um, that, that's all I have. I, I think they do need to get done. Um, um, I completely understand the other sensitivity. I won't mention the dirty word again <laughs> this evening. Uh, but but we do need to fix start fixing the the inundation king tides and also I'd really love to get r r Despite what happens with Distant Avenue. I'd really like to get uh, a handle on Mango Street and finishing that up mm -hmm. that what's being done right now is is um, Mango Street, but there was the second part of that right for the stormwater So I, I just want to point that out clarification what we're doing right now on Mango Street was not the end of the project. We had still had to do the stormwater, which was not part of the, offend, the, the funding that we're doing right now. So this is something that's badly needed. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. City Manager LaCourse, the light is on. Thank you. Two things. First of all, I want so everybody knows the position of the city manager and staff, and so it can come from me, so it can be on tape and everybody can see it. We're looking at the project on MLK strictly as dealing with the flooding project. That's how we and staff are going forward with it. How the road is elevated, whether it's the road it is or, or a roundabout, that is something that will be decided later. And since we had those series of public meetings and we've had the controversy, and obviously it's my attempt to keep as much controversy out, um, we have approached it as looking at the flooding problem and there would be more input and a board decision of what the look of that raised road would be. So that's our position. We don't have a position on the raised roads. That's something that need to be decided later by the board um, with more public input. The second thing I think for clarification for the candidates, for the people watching, if you just briefly go through everything that's going on with mirrors, if you'll go through what is going on on West Mears with the site, we've got several things going on. Explain the, how the phase one and the phase two happened um, when we found out the price. Explain what project is beginning now that will deal with some of the issues Mr. Lunt talked about on the west side of Mears that, that it looks like a bare road because that was the bare requirements that the that the people had to do to get that through. Just a quick going through of everything that's going on mirrors, the projects, and again, remember there are listings on the website of all the projects going on and they're updated with the status. Go those real fast so everybody can know what's going on with mirrors and how this phase one and phase two happened. I think a fast overview will help the commission, the candidates, and the public. Sure, um, very fast. The, uh, the mirrors extension, the, the brand new road that's, in, that's currently, everyone's using, um, it's going to get a facelift. Um, the yard waste scale house is being relocated and as part of that project, we're adding sidewalks along that extension, landscaping and crosswalks. That's all coming. Um, those plans are almost ready and they're going to go out to bid soon. Um, the project that, that everyone sees that part of Mango that's closed now, that's the first half that the Commissioner Vehicles was talking about. Um, that is a uh, comprehensive project. It's got uh, bike lanes, it's got sidewalk, it's got stormwater. Um, but it's only half of Mango. The second half of Mango is the one we're talking about getting the state funding for. This, this is the one we're talking about tonight. That's also gonna have the bike lanes, the sidewalks, and we put landscaping in the design as well. So th there's a whole bunch of stuff coming there. It's gonna get better. Bear with us. But it'll finish it off if we get sure. this money. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that what you're looking for? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Bob, thank you for the clarification on that. You pretty much said everything I wanted to say. So uh, on, on the aspect from the comments, um, it seems like there's a negative connotation from the public uh, that have spoken about these items. This is a positive thing. Uh, the city received one and a half million dollars from the state this past year uh, for funding for different projects in the city. One's a turn basin and the other one's a flooding issue on the sponge docks. That's great news. We could use those dollars to fix those projects, and then what we're able to do is we're able to take the money that we have, the small bucket of money that we have, and use on different projects, and get to other projects quicker. So um, this is close to, actually it's over a million dollars, um, maybe 1.1 $1 million if these are allocated. Uh, again, if we get this from the state, that would be awesome. Uh, it would allow the city to, to get more projects done quicker, and we don't have to take funds from other 
um, future budget years to do these projects. Everyone understands MLK and Spring Boulevard at the bridge is a terrible location uh, because of flooding. The idea of a roundabout I brought up a couple years ago just to bring up an idea. I wasn't saying we have to do this. I wasn't saying this must be done. The goal was to uplift the location just like public comment was. And I enjoy the, the laughter and the, the shaking of heads by candidates because they don't understand the history of it. Um, but it's, uh, again, it's just a, a negative connotation continuously uh, from some candidates. And I, there's so many great things that are happening here. Uh, and our city, there's so many great things that we're working with the state on. Uh, and this is one of those areas that the residents have said, we need to address this. We've all driven through it. High tide's not fun. You don't want to drive through salt water. Um, however, we uplift this idea. I mean, you had two people talk about it. That's exactly what we're talking about, what staff's talking about. And it also had to increase safety for pedestrians. It's a highly uh, pedestrian area, biking, walking, running. So these are things that, um, as a commission, that we look at, and as our, our staff, they're looking at this too, and I really appreciate you all bringing this forward. Um, Bob, thank you for moving with some speed on this one and bringing this forward before us. Uh, and also to reiterate, um, it's uh, the connection from US 19 to Ultra 19, you're looking at two state roads as well too. So the Mango to Mears is an important aspect to connect the two state roads and finalize the, that connector. Um, and city manager, thanks for bringing up the little details about, uh, or the large details about mirrors being uplifted as well too and the sidewalks that are going in. Obviously these are all important things to the city, but we have to take it as a whole and how do we approach it? Um, one thing I've encouraged the city manager in the past is how do we reach out to the county? How do we reach out to the state? So we have a lot of, the majority of the, the public right now are candidates running for commission. So how do we, how do we get money from other sources? How do we get money from the state? How do we get money from the federal government? How do we get money from the county? So we're able to extend our money further and do projects quicker. So ultimately, I think this is a great, um, two great projects. Looking forward to, uh, to talking to both the, um, the State House and the State Senate about these items. Uh, I know the mayor is an advocate for the city of getting uh, funding from the state as well too. So um, just for future years, this is something I think is important that we do each year as a commission, uh, three or four projects um, to at least propose to whoever our elected officials are. Um, one thing I do want to bring up too is the hospital. Um, the hospital's in need of a, uh, a shell, an updated renovation of the shell. They did a great job on the emergency room. I think most of us have toured it. Uh, it's a beautiful emergency, a beautiful emergency room, state of the art, uh, much larger than the old one. But one of the issues that they run into right now is if they have a hurricane, I think anything above a category one coming, they have to evacuate the whole uh, hospital. And so that, what it does is it's, our community hospital, right, we, we as a community use it. Um, the city of Tarpon Springs owns the property. They lease the, the building and the property from the city of Tarpon Springs. And in this aspect, uh, I think it's imperative, and I think it's important to partner with the hospital on, on this to help, help um, I guess, uh, harden the outside of the building. It's about $20 million to do that. Um, Obviously, they're going to try to do it themselves, but I think it's important to try to find additional funding sources to help along with that. And if that's American Rescue Fund funds, not all of it, but part of it, or state funding or county funding or something along those lines, I think it's important that we don't have to move our residents out of the hospital when we have a hurricane coming and they get to stay there and it's a safe place for them to be in multiple, like in anything higher than a Category 1. So if there is some type of addition that we could look at and work with the, the hospital city manager, um, or if there's another application we could look at for grants or something along those lines to partner with them, I think it would be important to, to utilize that opportunity as well too. So, thank you. I just hope they don't think it's related to this item that we're talking about. What are you talking about? You just wanna hear. State funding? No, no, I'm talking about this addendum. What you were just talking about, the hospital, that has nothing to do with that. But it's state funding. We could request state funding, though, is what I was talking about. Yeah, in a different way. But this is only for the two projects that we have in progress. Correct. So there's two projects, and I was saying we should look as a for third people, one. It's clear to the people that's not what we're talking about. Correct. I'm okay. not sure I understand. We're talking about the hospital now? No. <laughs> what I was saying is there's an opportunity, I think, to apply for additional funding for the hospital. Currently, there's only two items that are being applied for for state funding. The state funding closing application is tomorrow. What I'm saying is in future years, I think the city should partner with the hospital to ask for state funding to help 
harden the building. That's what I was getting at. Okay. That's not related to what we're talking about. Oh, I understand now, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Commission Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, this is an item to ask for state help funding infrastructure improvements, and that answer should always be yes. I support it. Thank you. Any other comments? Roll call. Commissioner Vaticiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. 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 Well, that concludes the uh, regular session agenda, and we go to uh, staff comments. No comments, sir. No comments. Mr. Jell? No comments. Thank you for serving with us tonight. <laughs> City Manager Lequeris? Just want to say, despite a lot of the problems with uh, um, distribution, um, I think that next week, before Thanksgiving, as usually is, you'll start to see in our community look a lot like Christmas. Um, it looks like we're on tap to install before Thanksgiving. Um, obviously, a month or so when they had the supply problems and stuff, but one of the good things of going with the same vendor several years is the vendor and us have a partnership, and I think he's taking care of all the issues, and I think we'll see this, this town convert um, towards the middle of next week before Thanksgiving or close to after, you'll see the conversion to the holidays and uh, our area downtown and by the bayous, gonna, you're gonna see that Christmas look um, hopefully into the end of next week uh, during the Thanksgiving week. So we're looking forward to that and, uh, and uh, really looking forward to how that looks. So it's on track. We've got, we've got most of the materials in, uh, thanks to our distributor working with us. So the Christmas look is coming. Uh, uh, be ready for it. Mr. Jacobs? I have no comments, thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor Carr? Uh, happy Thanksgiving to uh, Tarpon Springs, the residents. Uh, overall, we've got a lot of great things happening. We've got a lot of great small businesses in Tarpon Springs. Just want to encourage uh, to get out and support um, overall. And uh, thank you to the staff on everything that's going on. Uh, please um, express our thanks to the staff, city manager. I will. Commissioner Donovan? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank the city manager and Tom Funchin and Tarpon Springs Little League. I think one of, if not the best things in our budget this year is Sisler Field being completely renovated, and that's going to be happening over the week of Thanksgiving. So um, nobody call uh, the city and think that people are just destroying the field. Uh, the fence is going to come down. The infield and outfield are going to be completely stripped, and uh, they're going to kind of rebuild it from the ground up. Um, that's something especially to be proud of because they worked with Tarpon Springs Little League to coordinate their schedule with their schedule. So typically when we budget for something like this, the project is going to happen when the project happens, when the bids come in, and, you know, the Little Leagues are just going to say, hey, that's tough, but you're getting a new field, so you should feel good about it. But what we did differently with this one was we actually got with them and said, okay, when does your fall season end and when does your winter season begin? And so we tried to line that up as best we could. Um, the fall season literally is just ending now, and uh, as soon as next week, that fence is going to be coming down. So that's something really exciting, and it should be all ready and prepped for the spring league. Um, so just really looking forward to that, really excited about that, and glad to see it move forward. Thank you. Commissioner Tikiotis. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, I wanted to, um, as a veteran, um, express my appreciation to um, the Elks Club for the um, sponsoring the Veterans Day observance at Craig Park. Um, also wish to thank our uh, police and fire honor guard and also our uh, police chief uh, Jeff Young and also our fire chief Scott Young and, and the personnel from their departments that were there as well. It's extremely important um, Veterans Day, Memorial Day is always a very important day in Tarpon Springs. Um, and and um, they seem to get uh, more and more uh, as far as drawing people. And, and I'm very happy to see that moms, dads, and children were there this time. Also, I wanted to thank the uh, Meadows community on Anclo Boulevard, um, along with their Veterans Club within that community for sponsoring 
another Veterans Day observance for the dedication of their memorial uh, uh, park there within the community. I think that was a very nice event. We had lunch afterwards. The Elks Club uh, sponsored um, lunch for the community as well at Craig Park. So both of them were very nice uh, affairs. Um, um, they're for a very um, honorable and certainly worthy, worthy cause and, and often also uh, uh, something that we shouldn't remember, uh, should never forget. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, wish to everyone happy Thanksgiving Day. And Mr. Laquitas, I have a question to ask you. Now that the Mayor's Boulevard has been completed, when are we going to install the uh, memorial sign for Dr. Jamendez? I think we should do that. Well, you heard that was one of the reasons why I had him explain the projects. We're doing that in the core. Obviously, we're doing the sidewalks and tearing some of the road up. So the plan was to put that in um, towards the end of, of that on the west end, the work we're doing on the west end. So it's coming up in, in this project that's coming now. Okay, but the sign is not going to be there where the sidewalks were built. That'll be, it's near the uh, alternate 19, correct? That wasn't my understanding. Where? Where it's supposed to get? Where the where the new portion is, where you cross the trail and the new portion is. I don't think we decided exactly, but the whole thing of Dr. Diamandis was putting that road through. So um, that's where we're that's where we we're going to put it. I, but, but that's not a final decision that the board made. But that was our understanding where it was going to go. Okay. And that's why we didn't want to do it with the additional work that was going to be done. We wanted to wait till that work was done, and then and then put it in then. Okay, just want to make sure that it gets there. Oh, it will. That was a promise I made to Dr. D a long time ago, so I'm, I'll make sure of that. Dr. D was a terrific person. Everybody liked him. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes the regular session, and it's adjourned at 9.31 p.m. <laughs>